State's first res uh, witness available. The state's witnesses are usually going to be down in a room that they're sharing in the, on the second floor, so when they call a witness, it may take us some time to get them from the second floor up here. So during that process, if you need to stand and stretch, feel free to do so, okay? We don't always know when wit one witness is going to be done and the next one's going to be available. Raise your right hand. You promised testimony you're about to give me the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes. Have a seat. And if you could please state your first name and last name and spell them both for the record, okay? Kathy Knutson, C A T H Y K N U T S O N. Can everybody hear okay? <coughs> um, Man, can you tell the jury how you're employed, please? I'm a 911 dispatcher for the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office. And what does it mean to be a 911 dispatcher? Uh, answer 911 and administrative calls. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and dispatch out any needed people. And how are you trained to become a 911 dispatcher? Uh, there's a certification program through the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy and through Department of Public Safety. And are you a certified 911 dispatcher here in the state of Iowa? Yes, I am. How long have you been a dispatcher that's been certified here in Iowa? 16 years total. So if somebody calls a 911 or places a 911 call on a cell phone, do you have screens in front of you that can tell you where the call is originating, or how does that work? Um, calls from a cell phone would come in. Typically, it'll grab the nearest tower. That tower information will load onto our computer. It looks like a computer screen. And then um, you can rebid the call is what they call it, and then it'll get more of a location. Not an address, but a location of where the call's coming from. Okay. So when calls come into the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office and you're the dispatch uh, answering the calls, are those calls recorded? Yes, they are. Do you have to push a button to record them, or are they just recorded automatically? No, our system records automatically every phone call coming in. I want to talk to you about a 911 call that you received on... August 30th, 2017 at 12.55 in the afternoon, okay? Okay. Were you, in fact, working that day? Yes, I was. And did you receive a 911 call at 12.55 that afternoon of August 30th, 2017? Yes, I did. Was that call uh, recorded? Yes, it was. Did that caller identify himself? He did. And what, uh, or how did he identify himself? He identified himself as Zach Cohen. And did he give you a location for where the call was coming from? Yes. And you said the call was recorded, right? Correct. Have you listened to it uh, prior to uh, coming on the witness stand here today? Yes, I have. Is it accurate? Yes, it is. Have you also had a chance to review uh, Courts Exhibit Number 151, which is a, a transcript uh, of that 911 call? Yes. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd move to admit State's Exhibit Number uh, 1 for the jury and Court Exhibit Number 151. Any objection? Uh, very good. Um, Your Honor, permission to publish uh, State's Exhibit Number 1 and allow the jurors, just for purposes of uh, uh, listening to the call, have State's Exhibit Number 151 passed out to them. Any objection? Uh, Grant? Commission to publish, Your Honor? Proceed. Okay. Any objections? Proceed. Chickasaw County, 911. Judge Jack Cohen, you need an ambulance sent out here to my apartment. Okay, what's your address, Zach? 107 South Hilltop Avenue in Alta Vista. Okay, what's going on? Uh, around nine, my girlfriend went to uh, feed our son, and then uh, about 11 or, or 11.30, she went to check on him, and he was gone. Gone, meaning? He died. Okay. He said, 
He's like uh, probably four months. I don't know if it's sudden death syndrome or what. Okay. So you live at 107 South Hilltop in, eight, in Alta Vista? What? At, um, Apartment 7. Apartment 7? Okay. And your son is four months old? And the last time they, they, you just checked on was nine? No, it was when she was at nine. Okay. And uh, she hadn't heard him. Uh, she went to check on her, and heard her cry or whatever, and it was probably about 11.30, 11.40, she uh, went to check on him, he, he passed away. Okay, so that's the last time they checked on him. Okay, what's your phone number there, Zach? Uh, 406-223-2193. Pretty sure the last time you checked. I just keep okay. me up. I'm okay. in shock. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'll get them paged out. Okay. I'll, I'm going to send an ambulance and everybody up there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. And your honor, if the jurors could pass those down, I can collect them. I can have the court attendant do it. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Mishak, would you collect those, please? Thank you, your honor. The transcript is an admitted exhibit, so it will be available to you in the jury room at the conclusion, but you cannot uh, keep exhibits throughout the trial. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Knudsen, State Exhibit Number 1, the audio we just played, was that your voice as the dispatcher on that call? Yes, it was. And the address that the caller gave of 107 South Hilltop Avenue in Alta Vista, is that in the confines of Chickasaw County, Iowa? Yes, it is. After you got the call, what did you do? I uh, paged out ambulance, first responders, and sent law enforcement to respond to that address. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Mm -hmm. Cross? No questions. Can this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. You may step down. Thank you. State's next witness. Come forward. Mm -hmm. Up here, Miss Reed. Where's your right hand? Your comes testimony about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes. Have a seat. Miss Timmons. Please introduce yourself to the jury. <clears throat> Ms. Frederick, you want to take a break? My name is Tony Frederick. Um, Can you spell your last name for the court reporter? F R I E D R I C H. Frederick, you recently retired, is that correct? That's correct. Where did you work at? I worked at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester, Minnesota for the Mayo Foundation. I worked in the intensive care unit after you have heart surgery. We do heart surgery on newborns all the way to adults on my unit. We take care of them. How long have you done that for? For about 30 years. What, what is the full amount of years that you've had in the medical field? It's about 35. And when did you retire? Just last month. What is your educational background? Um, I got my um, associates of, of diploma in of associates of arts degree from Mason City, Iowa. I have certificates in uh, basic life support, adult, uh, advanced adult life support, pediatrics life support. And um, I'm also a county medical examiner investigator through our county in Chickasaw. What does that mean? That means that if um, someone dies unexpectedly, uh, they would call one of us. Uh, there's three of us in the county. They would call one of us and we would 
go out and assess and uh, survey the situation and then um, then hand that hand our assessment over to the medical examiner in the county and then he would write the uh, death report or it could also go to the state medical examiner absolutely if we deem that it needs to go to the state medical um, there are certain criteria we go by and if we deem that it needs to go for an autopsy we send it either to the state medical examiner or we can also send it to Mason City Iowa now, you also uh, work, have worked as a first responder over the years, correct? Correct. How long have you done that? Um, well, uh, before I had children and then once I kind of got into having kids, uh, well, I have three. Um, anyhow, I was a first responder at that point and then I stopped because I just couldn't do it with, uh, with the, when the kids were little. And so then after, um, in the last... Uh, it, like since 2014, I got back into being a first responder again. What are your duties as a first responder? We have, um, how our, our county is set up, we have pagers that now goes on to your cell phone when there's a call and you're available to go in your area that you just get paged out to that, to that call and then you would just go. Is that a volunteer position? Volunteer, yes. Do you still do that now? Yes. All right, I'd like to talk to you about August 30th, 2017. Were you paged out to a residence regarding an infant? Yes. Where were you at when you received the page? I was in my kitchen. And without giving your address, generally, what? Uh, where's your residence at? It's like about three miles from, from Alta Vista. We farm. About what time did you receive that? It was around one o'clock. What did you do? I got in, thank you. I got in my car and I went. And did you have an understanding uh, as to what you were going to? Yes, uh, the page came out as a four-month-old possibly dead. So my mind goes, okay, you know, CPR, basic life support, uh, respiratory. Why well, is going to be doing CPR on this child? You've been to scenes with infants in distress before. At work, I have been. I have seen infants in distress before, yes. So how long did it take you to get to Alta Vista? Not very long. I don't. A few I, minutes? Yeah. Were you able to find the residence right away? No, I missed the apartment seven. So the streets hilltop goes north and south. So I was looking for the uh, address on the north and south. Uh, hilltop when in fact and I had to call back in and at the time that I called back in I saw uh, uh, Tina Shattuck who's the mailman she was stopped and at the same and and it was summertime the window I had the windows down at the same time I was talking on the phone to get the address again then Tina was right there and when he said apartment 7 then I knew where to go because I know those apartments and the apartments are somewhat in the in a block it's a complex correct yes okay. and you were just unsure which side of the yes complex to go yes to. and you said you ran into tina shattuck do you know her yeah she's a neighbor yes all right so did tina help you get to uh, the right address as well um she she at the same time that when i called back in it came over he said apartment seven and um then I just took off after that. You arrived at the apartment? Yes. What did you do? So I pulled up and um, I pulled right up and uh, I saw a, a man, a woman, and a little girl. And I got on my car and I went running up to them and said where's the baby 
uh, I didn't, nobody was showing any emotion and, and the man goes inside and I said, show me. And so he took me inside, we walked in and we went to the, we went to the back bedroom. <clears throat> he took me to the back bedroom and it was dark and it was stuffy and there was a stench of urine there. I was looking for a crib, I couldn't see a crib. I said, where's the baby? And he said, in the swing. And, I, and it, it was dark, I said, we've gotta get some lights on in here, turn the lights on. And he flipped the switch and the lights came on and he, as he was, and he walked away and he muttered something and I don't know what he muttered. when the lights came on well you could see the the um, swing it was facing an outside wall in the corner and so then I um, went over so I could see Sterling the baby that's found out that's what his name was and <clears throat> To, to do my assessment, look, listen, and feel. Um, his eyes were fixed and dilated, staring straight out. Um, uh, he had blood around his mouth. And uh, I went to check a brachial pulse on him and his arm was stiff and rigid and cold. All of his extremities were cold. His little feet were cold. His hands were clenched in a fist and he wasn't breathing and his, his clothes were like crusty. When you saw, when you saw Sterling, did you know that there was nothing you could do? Yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's no CPR. It, it's, you know, it just wasn't right. Was he in clothing or blankets? <clears throat> he had clothes on his, the clothes that was on his chest was crusty. He had a blanket that was draped over him that was wet, and when I, I, uh, when I brushed up against that, when I touched that, it was there were bugs that flew from that. When you say bugs, what did they look like to you? Just little gnats, little. How big was this room? It was, it was a small room. Um, and you said that the swing was in the far corner facing the outside wall? Correct. So when you first walked in the room, could you see Sterling at all? No. You were just seeing the back of the swing? After he turned the lights on, yes. Because I was looking for a crib or, yeah. Did the room have windows in it? There was blankets over the one window that was in there so that there wasn't, it didn't show any light. What did the room feel like? It was hot, it was stuffy. There was the stench of urine. What did you do? Well, after I, after I did my assessment and realized that I couldn't do anything, I called back into the sheriff's department and asked for the sheriff to come and another medical examiner. Why did you call the sheriff's department? Because this was not right. Something was not right here. Did she, Tina Shattuck come into the room at any time that you were there? She came to the door and said, Tony, what can I do? And I, I told her to go out and be with the family. <laughs> that yeah
Who is the next person that arrived that you interacted with? Jeremy McGrath. Who's that? And Jeremy McGrath is um, another medical examiner investigator, uh, and he also uh, runs and owns the ambulance uh, service there in Chickasaw County. How long did you stay at the scene? I stayed there until law enforcement told me to leave. You stayed with Sterling? Yes. While you were at the residence, did you ever leave Sterling? No. Did you see the defendant, Cheyenne Harris, at the house that day? When I got there, yes. Was she present in the courtroom? I can't see her. She has her head. If the judge could ask the defendant to move her hand from her face. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Yes. Uh, with the purple shirt on? Correct. The record would reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. So noted. What did you observe her doing? Did you only see her when you first arrived? That is correct. Did you ever talk to her? No. You said you saw a little girl. What did she look like? Uh, cute. She had a very nice dress on. It was very colorful. Um, I have three daughters. It, it was kind of a dress that I would put them in for Easter or, uh, or for a special occasion or something like that. Uh, wasn't a play dress, it was a, a, a very nice fancy dress. I'd like to show you a couple photographs. May I approach on? May. Photographs. Yes. Are those all photographs uh, that were taken of Sterling while he was in the home? Yes. This time the state would enter or offer exhibits two, three, and four. Any objection? None. Are. They are admitted. Permission to publish? Any objection? Granted. what you would see if you would you would have walked into the room and took a couple more steps and that's where his swing was sitting towards that wall there at the where Sterling was laying. In the top left corner of the photograph we see what looks to be a quilt. Is that what was hanging over the window? Yes. Yes. There's also a pink blanket on the floor. Was that there when you went in, did you, or did you move that blanket? Off? I did not move that blanket. How about the bottle in the, by the wall? Had you moved that? I didn't. I didn't touch anything except the. The, no, I didn't touch anything of uh, that. Is it fair to say that you didn't move anything, and what you touched was? Sterling to see if there's yes. a pulse. Yes. The 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 pulse and and whether or not he was breathing and his the his extremities. I'm gonna put up states exhibit three. 
Is this what Sterling looked like when you first came on him? Yes. You said this blanket was wet. Is that the blanket that we're seeing, the red and blue blanket on top of him? Yes. You felt and that? Yes. And that's also the blanket that when I tried to take a brachial pulse, uh, that it moved that, and that's where the, the bugs. You described his arms as being stiff and his, his little hands and fists. Do we see that in the photograph? Yes. I'm going to put up State's Exhibit 4. Is that a closer up picture of Sterling than yes. what you saw that day? Yes. And again, yeah. And there appears to be stains on the car seat. And Did you see a lot of discoloration on the, on the, the blankets and the car seat and the swing? Yeah. yeah. There's no question. It was what? It was just his, around his, his clothing was just crusty. It was, it was hard. It was, yeah. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Any questions? I do think it's a good time to take a recess. Uh, we've absorbed quite a bit of information in 50 minutes, so let's take about a 10 or 15 minute recess. All rise for the jury. Let's shoot for 15 minutes and see where we're at. Okay. Um, Mr. McAllister, I don't have one or 151. I don't have one or 151 uploaded. Okay, what is? 151, just to be clear, Your Honor, I'll double check, but it's a court exhibit. We're not going to send it back to the That's the transcript? Yes. Oh, okay, so yes. that's why I have the one. The one is a physical exhibit. Yep. I've been ahead. searching for the last 10 minutes. I'm sorry. Excuse well, me. Yeah. And I'll double check with my paralegal on 151, make sure it gets it into the system, okay? Oh, that's fine. It pretty much goes without fail. Even though I tell you, you don't have to sit in the same seats, everyone always seems to go to the same seat regardless. <laughs> well, I know you want to sit because so you're not in front of the window. I know. <laughs> but I was watching that with good interest, thinking, they're going to do it again. All right. Mr. Hawbaker, cross-examination. CPR and him or not, and I did not start CPR. Understood. And the blanket uh, that uh, Sterling was in was moist or wet, is that correct? Correct. Now, the position of the chair as you entered the room, that was stays exhibit two, when you first entered the room, that was the first time you'd ever been in that room, correct? Correct. So you would have no knowledge as to when that chair uh, but was put in that position. Correct. Or the swing, I should say. Correct. Uh, or who was responsible for putting it in that position. Correct. I have no further questions. Redirect. Once you observed that, that there was no assisting Sterling, you knew at that point not to touch or move anything, is that right? Correct. Why is that? Because I waited for law enforcement to come. Fair to say at that point that Sterling was crime scene. Correct. That's, That's why I called the sheriff. That's why I called back into dispatch and requested the sheriff and another medical examiner. That's all I have. Can this witness be excused? Yes. You may step down. State's next witness.
The state would call Tina Shatek. Go ahead. Is your mic on, Aaron? Is that better? Okay. When I'm speaking, I'll make sure, or she'll make sure that I have it at my at my mouth. No, thank you. you Promise testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. Have a seat. Um, but if you could please, just a minute. Yeah, anytime you can't hear, please give my attention or the court attendants, and we'll do what we can. Okay. Ready, Your Honor? Proceed. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, if you could please state your first and last name for the record and spell them both, please. Tina Shattuck, T-I-N-A-S-H-A-T-E-K. And Tina, how old are you? I am 58. And where do you live? Um, I live on a farm with my husband by Alma. And do you have any children? Yes, we have four adult daughters and seven grandchildren. And how old are your grandchildren? 12, 10, 7, 5, 4, and two one-year-olds. Okay, so quite a group. Yes. Um, tell me, ma'am, how are you employed? I work for the United States Postal Service. And what position do you hold with the United States Postal Service? I'm a rural carrier. How long have you done that? 22 years. In 22 years, has the Postal Service where you worked ever not delivered mail? No. Is today the first day? Yes. And you're that here I know and, of. and you're off? Yes. Okay. Um, where do you deliver mail in Chickasaw County? I deliver mail in Elma and Alta Vista. Can you describe the town of, of uh, Alta Vista, please? It's just a small town, 300 people. And how far away from Alta Vista do you live? six miles. Now in your lifetime, ma'am, have you ever had any experience or training as a first responder? Yes, um, 20 some years ago. And what was your first responder training? What was it? Yeah, what did it consist of? Just um, on, to go on calls. As an EMT? Yes. And did you uh, maintain your EMT certificates? No. Um, and why was that? I was too busy with the children. And that's the four children? Yes. And the husband? Yes. And the farm? Yes. Okay. Um, have you ever, prior to August 30th, 2017, met the defendant Cheyenne Harris? No. How about her live-in boyfriend, Zachary uh, Cohn? No. Uh, their son, Sterling? No. Their baby, Nala? No. Are you familiar, or were you familiar, at, on August 30th, 2017, in your duties as a mail carrier with the apartment complex located in Alta Vista at 107 South Hilltop Avenue. Pardon me? That, that was a poor question, wasn't it? <laughs> Let me start again. As a mail carrier, did you deliver mail to 107 South Hilltop Avenue in Alta Vista? Yes. And that's an apartment complex, yes. right? Can you describe it for the jury? There's three separate apartment buildings but all the mailboxes are on the street. So I, if I don't have a package, I don't need to go into the building. And how, how many apartment building, excuse me, how many apartments are in each apartment building? Four. So there's a total of 12 apartments and three buildings? Yes. Had you ever, prior to August 30th, 2017, been inside apartment number seven? Yes, before they were there. So not when the uh, defendant lived at that residence? Correct. Do you know Tony Frederick? Yes. How do you know her? I used to babysit her children when they were little. Okay. Now I want to turn your attention to August 30th, 2017. Were you working that day delivering mail? Yes. And were you delivering mail in Alta Vista? Yes. Was that your route? Yes. Now about one o'clock that afternoon on August 30th, 2017, where were you physically located? Right by the apartment building. And what happened then? I saw Tony driving fast down the street with her flashers on, and so I um, turned to stop, she turned around, came back, stopped by the stop sign, and I pulled up to her to ask her if I could help her find her way, because I knew she was looking for something. 
Well, let me ask you a couple follow-up questions. When you said Tony, who were you talking about? Tony Frederick. And you said she appeared to be lost or looking for something? She was looking for something, yes. And how could you tell that? Because she flew back, she went one way, came back the other way, and then stopped there. Did you know that she was an EMT or a first responder? Yes. So what did you do? I pulled up to her and asked her if I could help her, and then she, she was on the dispatch, and they told her she was looking for apartment 7, and I pointed it to her. She wasn't far from it. Why did you do that? Because I wanted to help. Okay. And what happened next? Um, Tony went in, and I went around the block and parked, and I went inside. And where did you park in relation to the uh, apartment complex containing apartment number seven? It would be on the north side of the building. And did you get out of your vehicle? Yes. What did you do? I walked inside. Inside what? Inside the apartment. And would that be apartment number seven? Yes. What did you see when you walked inside apartment number seven? I saw Tony kneeling down by the baby. And so did you enter into the back room of the apartment? Yes. Prior to entering into the apartment itself, did you see anybody else around? The parents were outside when I arrived. And what did you observe about the parents? They were just very quiet, no tears. Did you see any children outside? Yes. What did you see? Their daughter. And can you describe the daughter? Um, dark, kind of dark complected, cute little girl. Do you remember what she was wearing? I do not. And did you make those observations before you went inside the apartment or after coming out? Before. And then you said you went inside the, the apartment and went to the back bedroom, correct? Yes. And you saw Tony kneeling by the child? Yes. Did you see the child? No. When you were making that observation of Tony, what was she doing? She was kneeling by the baby, and I went up to her to ask her what I could do to help, and she wasn't performing any emergency care. What did that mean to you? That the baby was probably gone. When you were in that room and you saw Miss uh, Tony kneeling by the baby, what was she kneeling by that the baby was in? A swing, a baby swing. Can you describe where the swing was in the room? It was up against the wall, facing the wall. When you were in that room, how did the room feel? Very warm. There wasn't air. Was there air moving? No. How did the room smell? Like dirty diapers. Can you describe how strong the smell was? Strong. What do you mean? Strong as in too strong for the children to be in there. Was it obvious when you walked in the room that smell? Yes. Did you see the baby? No. Why not? Because she wasn't performing any care and I didn't feel I needed to have those memories. So you chose not to look at the child? Correct. What happened next? Tony said I should just console the parents. So I turned around and they were standing right outside of the bedroom. And I went up to them and told them I was sorry and what had happened. And she said that the baby was fine last night at 9.30 when I fed him. I said him, and he said yes, Sterling. So, I said, do you mean this morning? And she said, I don't know. Now I want to go through that a little bit again. So you walked out of the apartment, correct? The, 
out of the bedroom. Excuse me, out of the bedroom. And where were the parents physically located? Right outside the bedroom. Okay. And so you you were asked to console the parents and you yes. attempted to do that, correct? Yes. How was Cheyenne Harris, her emotional state when you talked to her? None. There was no tears. There were no... No emotion. And how close to the bedroom where Sterling lay in the swing was she at the time? Not very close. Very close. It's a very small apartment. Still a distance where you could smell Sterling? Yes. Did that reaction seem strange to you? Yes. Why? Overruled means. She should have been crying and screaming and upset. And you asked her what had happened, is that correct? Yes. And did you say that she told you the baby was fine, she fed him last night at 9.30? Correct. And you said something in response to that? I said, you mean this morning at 9.30, I said a four-month-old would have needed to be fed sooner than that. And what did she respond to that? Nothing. When you were talking to the parents, had law enforcement arrived yet? Yes. Then Reed Palo came in and he took them in the bedroom, the other bedroom across from where the baby was. And what did you do at that point? I left. Why did you leave? Because I wasn't feeling too good. Where did you go after you left? Went out on my route. Did you stop? Yes. Why? Because I had to throw up. And why did you throw up? Because it was so sad. And had I known that child was there all that time, every day I drove by, I could have done something. And that day I was just too late and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross? Yes, Your Honor. Is this good? Okay, thank you. Ma'am, just uh, briefly, you were kind of in and out of the apartment, is that right? Just quickly in and then told to go console the parents? I was in the apartment, went into the bedroom, went out of the bedroom, and then left the apartment to go home. And you, you had a, uh, had you ever met Ms. Harris before? No. Okay. When you did ask her when the last feeding was, she ultimately said she didn't know. Is that fair? The second time. Right. And you had an opportunity to speak with uh, Reed Palo, is that correct? He took them in the bedroom. But you had an opportunity to speak with him. He actually interviewed you? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that interview, I believe, was recorded? Yes. And... When you were talking to Mr. Palo about that lack of emotion, did you tell Mr. Palo that you were not sure if the mother was depressed or on drugs or what? Yes. Okay. I don't have anything further. Thank you. Redirect. Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Can this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. You may step down. Next witness. State would call Deputy Jason Russell. Raise your right hand. Your Trump's testimony about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Have a seat. Thank you. Um, sir, if you could please state your first and last name and spell them both for the record. My name is Deputy Jason Russell. It's J-A-S-O-N. My last name is R-O-S-O-L. 
And sir, it's probably obvious from your attire today, but what's your profession? I'm a Chickasaw County deputy. And can you tell the, uh, the jury your educational background that qualifies you to be a deputy sheriff? I have a, a two-year degree from Hawkeye Community College in Waterloo. Um, before that time, I was in the military. And uh, prior to getting my degree, I did hours and hours of uh, ride along with the Iowa State Patrol, Chickasaw County, and National Police Department. And can you tell the jury, did you graduate from the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy? I did. And when did you do that? I graduated uh, from the, well, I was hired in Nashua on February 27th, um, would have been 2011. And so it would have been August, I believe, after that. And what is the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy? That's a standardized academy that uh, trains us. Um, officers and certifies us in different different um, things that we need to know. It teaches us the knowledge, different techniques that we need to use. Um, basically, it prepares us for um, things that we might see on the job, the basic level. And you are a certified peace officer here in the state of Iowa? Yes, I am. And you mentioned before that you had some military training as well. Can you describe for the jury what branch you served in and kind of your, your uh, service in the military? I was in the United States Navy. I was stationed in San Diego. Um, I started in the supply chain. Um, basically, I was a storeroom clerk. Um, I hated that. And so I, I transitioned into policing. Um, and of course, right after I transitioned and started to like the job, my wife got pregnant, gave me the ultimatum, and I got out. Were you honorably discharged? I was. And so how many total years experience do you have in law enforcement? Um, total years in law enforcement? Uh, again, my start date was February 27, 2011, so right around eight years, or a little under. Now, back on August 30th, 2017, were you assigned a particular shift as a deputy sheriff? Yes, that day um, I was working a day shift. I was At that time, we worked a six and three schedule, six days in a row, three days off, and I was assigned a day shift, which was the hours of... 9 a.m. in the morning till 5.30 p.m. at night. On August 30th, 2017, uh, how many deputies were on duty in Chickasaw County? On that particular day, I was what's considered the call car. Um, basically, I was, I was the call that, or the car that if any calls came in, I took it. Um, if there was any papers that needed to be served, I did it. Um, I also had two administrators working with me. Um, Sheriff Heeman and Sheriff, or I'm sorry, Chief Deputy Palo. So there were three of you on duty that day, but you were the one responsible for the calls, correct? Correct. So what was the, the area that you were patrolling or being responsible for that day? All 505 square miles of Chickasaw County. Prior to August 30th, 2017, had you ever met the defendant Cheyenne Harris? No. How about her live-in boyfriend, Zachary Cohn? No. Uh, their ch uh, child, Sterling Cone? No. How about their other child, the daughter, Nala? No. Were you familiar with the community of Alta Vista? Yes. Can you kind of describe Alta Vista for the jury, please? Alta Vista is a small rural count county on, or a town, I guess, on the, uh, <coughs> be the northwest side of Chickasaw County. Its population is 300 to 400 people. Um, like I said, it's, real, it's very rural. Um, largest town closest to it is New Hampton, which is about the center of our county. So if you think about our county as a square, it's up in the one corner, and the closest big town is in the center. Uh, is there a local police department in Alta Vista? There is not. How about a grocery store or convenience store? There's a, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a convenience store gas station. And is that convenience store and gas station within walking distance of the apartment complex where the defendant lived? Yes. Now, you have already testified that on August 30th you were on uh, the, the day shift as the road deputy, correct? Yes. And you were covering all 505 square miles of Chickasaw County, right? Correct. Were you dressed that day as you are now in a police uniform? Exactly. And was it clear that you were an officer based on your dress? Yes. About 1255 that afternoon on August 30th, 2017, where were you physically located? I was actually on uh, a previous call. I was on the south side of the county on Highway 63. 
And were you dispatched to a call uh, for uh, an infant at, in distress located at the apartment complex at 107 South Hilltop uh, Avenue in Alta Vista? Yes, I was. I, I had been told that there was a four-month-old that had recently passed. And can you give the jury a, an understanding, basically, your physical location, because it's a different county, uh, in relation to where the community of Alta Vista was located? Yes, as I kind of said, our county is square. Um, not like your county is more rectangle, ours is more square. Uh, Alta Vista is in the northwest corner, so it would be the, the upper left corner if you're thinking about it, if you're looking at it. I, and I would have literally been about the other side, um, the opposite corner on the bottom. So how far did you have to travel from your location to the call location? I believe, um, well, the county as a whole, I would have been on 300th. So I'm not sure the exact miles off the top of my head, but I would have had to go at least from 300th, you have to count all the way up to 100th Street and go over to west, all the way over to basically uh, uh, be Gilmore. So oh, it'd be anywhere from uh, you know, 14 to 25. I didn't mean to have you do math. Right. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't get a degree in math. Um, but I, I, I don't know the exact miles, but I was literally as far as far away as I can get in the county. Okay, and let me ask you a different way. Your report says the call came in about 12.55 and you arrived at the residence at about 1.09 p.m. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And I assume that you drove with some pace, correct? Yes, I did. And why did you do that? Because the uh, call said had come in as an, it was a four-month-old that had recently passed. We've had calls like that in the past, or we've heard about calls like that in the past where sometimes we can hook the AED up to that person, maybe save that person, uh, you know, and, and maybe take some life-saving preventative steps. I drove a, uh, what we call 1033, which is lights and siren, and I went as about, um, about as fast as I safely could get there. And when you arrived at the apartment complex, did you park there? I parked just north of the apartment complex. Can you kind of describe the apartment complex for the jury? Yeah, if, if you think about the, uh, let's see, the um, best way I can describe the apartment complex is it's three separate buildings, but they're all part of the same kind of complex. And it, if you're standing on the north side of the complex looking south towards the buildings, it's basically a backwards U or an, or an N if you're looking at it that way. You have a north-south uh, building on this side, a north-south building on this side, and in the middle is an east-west building. And in which one of the buildings is apartment number seven located in? It was in the middle building, the east-west building. When you arrived at the apartment complex, were other officers there before you? Yes. And, and who was there before you? Chief Deputy Palo had beat me to the scene. And when you arrived, what did you do? As soon as I arrived, I'd seen, um, again, I'd seen Chief Deputy Palo's truck. Um, so I called out my location, uh, told the dispatch I was on scene, and immediately went towards that building. And did you go inside the apartment? I met um, a male individual um, who I knew to be the fire chief, Kevin Hupka, and I wasn't sure, I knew the building, but I didn't know which um, exact apartment was, because there's four apartments in each building. And so he, he had told me which apartment to go to. So he directed you to the apartment number seven? Yes. What did you do next? Then I went, um, from there I went into the building and then entered the apartment. When you went into the apartment, what did you see? Um, as I entered the apartment, I guess the first thing I noticed is, uh, you walk right into the living room area, um, and there's a kitchen off to the right. I remember thinking um, it was kind of dirty, um, but there was a video, a kid's video playing on the TV um, that had ended, so it kept going on repeat the end credit, kind of like the, re, um, the repeat the video type deal. Uh, I rem and then I remember seeing um, our ambulance personnel, Jeremy McGrath, and uh, first just first responder, uh, I guess our medical examiner at that time was Tony Fredericks. Did you ask where the baby was located? I did. 
And were you directed to where the baby was located? Yes. They directed me to the back bedroom. And did you go into that back bedroom? I did. Can you kind of describe what you could see when you were in the doorway of that back bedroom looking into the bedroom? If you, excuse me, if you opened the door and didn't enter the bedroom, the door was swing to the, it would be to the left. And um, there was adult size, I call it adult size because I don't know if it's a full or a queen uh, mattress that was on the wall that would be right on the left side. That wall would have been the same wall that separated the, the what we call the master bedroom and this bedroom that the child was in. There was a car seat laying there, um, a, a bouncy swing. There was lots of clothes piled up. Um, I saw diapers, uh, blankets, uh, and then uh, in the corner, facing the corner, was a swing with the baby in it. When you said you saw diapers, can you describe what you meant by that? Yeah, um, I've got four children of my own, um, so I've had baby showers, and these were like the diapers that you get at a baby shower. They do them as a baby cake, or when they roll them up and put a rubber band on them. Those were the diapers that I saw, newborn diapers. And that was the size they were, was newborn diaper size? Yes, they were. And so would these have been clean diapers or soiled or dirty diapers? They were clean diapers. And they had rubber bands around them? Yes, they did. Oh. Um, did you enter the room? Yes, I did. Why did you do that? To start the investigation. And as you entered the room, can you kind of describe for the jury how the room felt as far as air temperature and air movement? <clears throat> well, first, I'm sorry. Can I have something to drink, maybe? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. I'm fighting a cold, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, don't. Just set it right there. Thanks. Let me just repeat the question for you, officer, okay? Um, so when you enter the room, if you could just describe for the jury how it felt as far as air temperature and air movement. Uh, the first thing I remember, um, even when I just opened the door, was thinking that this room, the heat was on, or that it was warmer, hotter than the rest of the apartment. Um, the other thing I noticed immediately was the, the strong odor of human urine. Um, I also noticed there was there was a big heavy quilt um, blocking the window or on the window so even if the window would have been open for air movement um, it wouldn't have been able to get through that quilt it was a thick quilt there was no fan in that room um, there was no air movement at all um, but I, I didn't take the temperature but it felt probably 10 degrees hotter in that room and when you say 10 degrees hotter, do you mean 10 degrees hotter than the rooms you'd walk through to get there? Correct. So the rest of the apartment was cooler than the room where Sterling was found? Much. And you mentioned that, that there was no fan in the room, is that correct? Correct. Was there an overhead light? Yes. Did the overhead light contain any type of fan on it? It did not. How about a box fan? Was there any box fan in that room? There was not. And so you mentioned when you walked in the room, you smelled a strong smell of urine, correct? Yes. Uh, did you notice anything else as far as smells when you walked into the room? When, when I got closer uh, to baby and got down on his level, um, he's about a foot and a half, two foot off the ground in that swing, I could smell, um, again, what, what I can only describe, because I've done this for years, is death. Uh, it, it's the smell of of the body doing what the body does when someone's gone. Um, that's, that smell was stronger, of course, as, as I got closer. Um, but I remember thinking that I could smell something fruity um, or almost like air freshener-like. And uh, at first I didn't realize what it was. And did you ultimately realize what that fruity or, or smell was? Yeah, right underneath the swing or kind of off to the side but right underneath the swing was um, these air freshener melts that you put in a candle and they melt and they the scentsies and they they put a sense in the room. Now 
when you talked about the smell that you smelled of urine when you entered the room, would it be, based on what you smelled that day, would it be obvious to anybody that entered that room that it smelled of urine and the other things you've described? Yes. Was it a strong smell? Yeah, it was absolutely the strongest human urine smell I've ever smelled. Now, you've talked about what you sm smelled and what you felt as far as the air temperature. I want to next talk about what you saw when you approached the swing where Sterling was located, okay? Okay. Can you describe what you saw as you approached the swing and kind of describe for the jury how you approached the swing? So, <clears throat> as I said, the, the, the door was kind of um, off to the side the, of the room a little bit, so when it swung open, he would have been, you would have saw him in that corner and off to the right. Um, he would have been facing the corner there to the right. The room was such a mess um, that there was stuff stacked on top of the car seat, stuff stacked on top of the, the bouncer. There was clothes piled up to the, the what would be the right of me um, behind the swing. Um, so I just basically followed the path that was there to baby um, and then got, there was a small space between um, the wall and in front of baby and I got in front of baby. And as you got in front of baby, how was that smell? It was much, much stronger as I got in front of baby. Um, and uh, yeah, it, when I got in front of baby, I, I kind of, I touched baby and then um, moved the, a blanket. Um, the reason I moved the blanket, I remember, was because there's a blue pair of pants underneath the swing. And I thought, I wanted to make sure he had been clothed or diapered on the bottom half. And um, as I moved that blanket, that smell was so bad that I had to hold my breath. Um, it, it just, that was, it was the most um, strong ammonia smell I'd ever, ever smelled. Now, can you describe what Sterling appeared to look like when you saw him? Yes. Uh, Sterling, his eyes were open. Uh, he had bright blue eyes and uh, his head was tilted to the left. He had slid down in the swing a little bit. He wasn't hanging off of the swing, but it, he, uh, he had slid down in the swing. Uh, he was wearing a blue top. Uh, I don't know if it was a onesie, because I never got down that far, but it was a blue top. I do know he is. Um, he did have pants on. They were army-type pants. Um, he did have some blood or body fluids on his uh, blue top that had come out his nose and his mouth. Um, his little hands were clenched, um, and they were in a fist, and they were up by his, kind of up by his face. Did you notice anything about his size? The first thing I thought um, was, as I said, I have, I have four children of my own, and one is actually about the same size, uh, the same age as Sterling. And so when I was dealing with Sterling, I thought that our dispatcher had made a mistake, maybe or had been told the wrong information. Um, my four-month-old didn't look like this one. Um, he was very small, very skinny, um, sickly, very, very small. Now, you mentioned uh, you have experience with children yourself, correct? Yes. And you have four children? Yes. And one is about the same age as Sterling? Yes. Were you familiar with the swing that Sterling was, was seated in? I actually had the uh, exact same model of swing and uh, bouncing chair. And did you use that swing with your own four-month-year-old? Yes, I did. Now, can you describe that swing for the jury? That's an electric, um, it's an electric swing. It's got three different uh, features on it. It has a... Uh, of course, it has the swing, so that it could swing. Um, the swing could do both side to side and front to back, so you could rotate baby. Um, it also has a mobile, so baby could look at something, um, and the mobile would move. It also <clears throat> played music. Now, when you looked at that swing when you were back in that back bedroom with Sterling, uh, was the swing uh, on or, or activated? The the main motor switch, which has to be on for any of those other features to work, was on, and the green light was on. And was the swing moving? The swing was not moving. Was it playing mu any music? No. 
Uh, is it possible for the swing to be on based on your experience with the swing and not move or play music? Yes. Can you describe that for the jury? Basically, it's just a toggle switch on the top, and you can turn it off or on. Um, a, a lot of parents will turn it on, and they'll turn the music on and, and let the child fall asleep. And then after a short time, the music will shut off or, um, or what have you. Again, you can always turn that on or off, um, but it's a toggle switch on top. And I assume that this is a swing that has to be plugged in? Yes. So there was a plug there? Yes. Um, when you looked at Sterling, did you notice any signs of any visible injuries to his body? I, I uh, of course, noticed the, the blood, or what I assume to be blood, coming out of his mouth or, and nose. Um, I noticed that he had some on his hand, which I figured was from him putting his hand in his mouth. Um, I noticed on multiple parts of his body there was brown. Um, I didn't know at that time if it was bruising or, or, uh, or what it might have been from. Um, but it, it had, basically his skin was stained. Um, after, after looking at it a while and um, messing with feeling the chair and, and going through the things, I realized the chair was soaked in urine. And that the stain was probably caused by that. I want to ask about you and your interaction with Sterling with your hands, okay? You okay. talked about touching the blanket. Did you touch Sterling's body uh, as well? I did. And why did you do that? As a first responder um, in a rural county, it takes a while sometimes for other personnel to get there. I'm, I'm not a medical examiner or anything, but we're trained to look for certain things. Rigor mortis is one of those. Um, if we feel like the, the uh, subject has been gone for a while, we'll check for rigor mortis, which is basically the, the body is stiffened, the muscles are tense and rigid. Um, there might be some bruising sometimes. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not a, a doctor or anything, but we're just basically trained in, in the basic knowledge of that. I can't tell you the time of death or anything like that. What did Sterling's body feel like when you touched it? It was cold and stiff. Rigor had set. And you've described how Sterling was positioned on the swing and kind of how he was clothed, correct? Yes. Did you touch his clothing? I did. And why did you do that? <clears throat> as, I, uh, as I stated, I, I didn't know. Um, the call had came in that he had recently passed. And what I was looking at, that wasn't right. Uh, it, that was wrong. Uh, he had not recently passed, and so I touched the, his underneath his collar where the blood and body fluids were um, to see, number one, if it was stiff or still um, wet, soft to the touch, or if I could try to get some sort of idea on how long that had been there. And when you touched uh, his body, uh, how did the, the clothing, excuse me, let me start over. When you touched his shirt and his clothing, how did the shirt feel first? It was stiff. And what do you mean? If I, I touched him right underneath the chin and the whole collar shifted where that body fluid was. It had dried. It had been there a while. And his, his body was covered by a, a blanket, right? At least part of his body. Yes. What part of his body? It would have been the lower part of his body. And did you touch and move that blanket? I did. And you were looking for whether or not he had pants on, correct? Right. As I stated, there was, there was a blanket and some blue pants that would have fit Sterling directly underneath the swing. And so um, I thought I'm, I should check and see if he was diapered and clothed from the bottom side. And so I moved the blanket a little bit to see if that was the case. And when you uh, touched the blanket, what observations did you make of the blanket? Well, the first thing I noticed is that the blanket was soaked in urine or body fluids. Um, it, it, it was completely wet. I mean, it was just, it was vile. It, the smell. Um, and as I moved the blanket, um, that smell just got worse. Did you see anything come out from under the blanket or off the blanket or from around the blanket when you touched it? Yes, I did. Um, what did you see? <clears throat> growing up in Iowa, I'm, uh, I've always called them gnats. 
Uh, you have bananas or apples out on your counter and you'll get these fruit flies or I call them gnats. Um, that'll come around and that's what flew out from underneath the blanket. And where did the, the flies go after they came out from under the blanket? They went up by his face and then out in the room. And I want to talk just in a few moments before lunch, unless you want me to stop now, Your Honor. It's a good place? It's a good place. All right. Why don't we take our lunch break at okay. this time? Uh, let's, because of the cold weather, let's take a little extra time. We'll resume at 110. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please continue to heed my admonition. Do not do any research on your own. Do not watch the, uh, the news over the noon hour. Uh, don't go on the Internet and research anything associated with this case. As I've said before, if you do so, you would be denying Ms. Harris a fair trial. So we'll see you at 110. Be safe. All right, Mr. Mr. McAllister. Thank you. Um, Deputy, when we left off, we were getting ready to talk about the swing that you found in the room where you found Sterling, okay? Okay. And you had described earlier this morning in your testimony that you yourself personally own that very model swing, correct? Yes, I did. So you're familiar, I assume, with uh, how the swing is set up, correct? Yes. Uh, can you explain to the jury how is it that when you put an infant into that swing, that the infant is attached or secured in the swing? That particular model has um, what I call a three-point harness. It has uh, basically the... Uh, it has the straps that come up from the sides, and then one will come up through um, the crotch area, and it'll connect in a three-point harness to hold the baby in place. And the material that the child lays on in the swing or the seat of the swing, what type of material is that, that insert in the swing made out of? The swing itself is a hard plastic, so, um, of course, they put a, a foam and then a, kind of a, a cloth over top of that so the baby's comfortable while he's in the swing. So does the baby lay on a cloth? Yes. And the cloth covers the plastic? Yes. Would that cloth be permeable to moisture? Yes. And now as far as the swing itself, when the child sits in the swing, are there any holes in the bottom of the swing? Yes, there are. As I, as I stated, that, that harness um, actually has to be pushed up through the backside, so there's three holes in the bottom of that um, swing. And so when you looked around the area underneath and around the swing, what did you see? When I, um, as I stated, when I walked into the room, I noticed that there was a blue pair of pants that would fit Sterling directly underneath the swing, and there was also a blanket. And were these items located directly under the swing? Yes. Um, did you touch the items of clothing that were, and other items of cloth that were located under the swing? Yes, I did. And what observation, observations did you make of those clothing and other items when you touched them physically? They were soaked in what I assumed to be the urine. Now, were they located in such a position that the urine could have run off of uh, Sterling's body onto those items underneath the swing? The, the way that they were located, they would have, um, it would have run off the swing through those holes from the harness. Um, they, were, they were directly underneath where that would have come through. Now, you had an opportunity that day to examine the entirety of the room where Sterling was found, that bedroom, correct? Yes. And you've already described that uh, there was a wall that separated that room from the master bedroom, right? Yes. When you looked in the room uh, where Sterling's body was found, you testified this morning that you found some diapers, correct? Correct. Did you find any soiled or used diapers in that back bedroom where Sterling was found? No, I did not. And you testified that you found some diapers that were rolled up and secured with rubber bands like the type you get at a baby shower uh, or a, a similar type of event, correct? Yes. And those had not been used, correct? Correct. They were unused. So no used diapers in the back room? Correct. No used diapers in the back bedroom. Now, as part of, of your job investigating this case as a deputy sheriff, did you uh, take efforts to uh, not only secure the scene but document what you found? I did. <clears throat> I, uh, I did take photographs of the scene, um, and I also... Uh, did my own narrative and added to our, our case report during that time. I also um, 
while I was on scene, I was in charge of what's called scene safety. Um, so what I did was I locked down the scene and I started a uh, basically an in and out log. I log anybody that went in and what time and anybody that came out. And as part of your job documenting the scene, you've testified you took some photographs, correct? Correct. And you've had a chance to look at those prior to taking the witness stand here today? Yes. I'm going to show you in a moment state's exhibits number 5 through 35. Those were photographs that you took uh, at the residence that day, including the outside of the apartment complex and the interior of the apartment number 7, correct? Correct. And you've reviewed those before testifying here today? Yes, I have. Do they fairly and accurately depict what you saw that day? Yes, they do. Um, Your Honor, I'd move for the introduction of state's exhibits 5 through 35. You may. Permission to publish them as well, Your Honor. Any objection, Mr. Hovick? No, Your Honor. Granted. May I leave? If I could have you in the lights like you did earlier, please. Papers on it. Thank you. Deputy, I'm going to hand you, it's okay with the court, a uh, pointer so he can use it to show and highlight items on the photographs that are on the screen? Absolutely. Thank you. And Deputy, this green button will highlight uh, on the photo, okay? okay? May he step down, Your Honor, so that he can uh, describe what these photographs show? Yes. Where do, you, where do you want him to stand? I want him to stand so the court reporter can hear him, so he can face the court reporter. That That's side. exactly what I was going to ask. So, Deputy, why don't we come down here so okay. we're in front of the camera, but try to speak more towards this way as opposed to your back towards Barb. Okay. So, Deputy, first I'm going to show you State's Exhibit Number 5. And you know, feel free to use your pointer to point whatever you think is appropriate to point out. But can you kind of tell the jury what State Exhibit Number 5 shows? Um, as I stated when I arrived on scene, I parked um, kind of north of the complex. There's a parking, um, I guess, parking area for the whole complex. Um, I then, this would be as if I'm standing in that complex uh, or that parking area, taking a picture of the building in question, um, which would be this building right here. Now, it appears that there's some people in front of the doorway on exhibit number five. Who are those folks? That uh, is Sheriff Marty Heeman. That's Cheyenne Harris. And that's her daughter, Nala. And when you um, arrived at the residence, did you interact in any way with Cheyenne Harris? I did not. Did you speak with her? I did not. How about the uh, other child, Nala? I did not. Thank you. I'm going to turn next to state exhibit number six. Can you describe for the jury the vantage point from which this photograph is taken and what it shows? This photograph is taken from the front door of the apartment. Um, so I'd already walked into the building itself and basically opened the apartment building uh, or apartment door. So uh, the apartment door is this one here. I just literally opened that and took a picture of what I saw. Um, as we're looking at that vantage point, can you point to where the bedrooms are in that apartment? Yes. This bedroom here, you can see the door's kind of cracked. This bedroom here is where we found Sterling. The, what we call the master bedroom would be back in this area. There's another door on this wall here. And then over here is the bathroom. So as you're looking at State's Exhibit Number Six, the one directly in the in the rear of the photograph would be the room where Sterling was located. On the right would be the bathroom. Correct. Correct. The room that your your first walk into the apartment. What is that room? We considered this the living room. It had the the movie playing on the TV. Um, it had the couch, um, the the hutch there, and then there was an air conditioner on the wall. And where would be the uh, kitchen area in this apartment? The kitchen area would be right over here. If you took a step and shut the door, the kitchen area would be right over here to the right. 
So as the right off uh, the, the field of view of a Civic 6, correct? Correct. Now at the top of the photograph there appears to be a fan, correct? Yes. Now obviously a snapshot is a moment of time, so can you tell the jury whether or not the, the uh, fan was circulating or moving when you went in there? That fan was moving. It was moving? It was moving. Okay. So it was turned on? Yes. And is this the room that you testified was cooler than the room where you found the child, Sterling? Yes. Thank you. I'm next to show you State's Exhibit Number 7. What does that show, sir? This is uh, me taking a couple steps in and basically turning around and showing the exit or where I just was. So that's that's where I took the first photo from, and then um, I literally just stepped in the apartment a couple steps, turned around, and took a picture of where I was. And sir, there seems to be some items of cloth on the couch. What were those? Those were uh, they're blankets. They're not baby blankets. They're kind of I call them toddler blankets. They're not really for a twin bed, but they're. Um, you see four, four year olds, six year olds, you know, have their, they're about this big, you get them in Walmart or Kmart. So not a blanket that you typically use for a newborn, is that right? No. Or an infant. Right. Exhibit number eight, what does that show, sir? Again, um, this shows that there was a kid's movie um, that had been playing. It also shows the air conditioner. And was the air conditioner operational or, or running? It was not on. And you said the movie, the kids' movie, was playing on a loop, is that right? Yes, it had finished, and so it, it kept going to this menu where it wanted you to play the movie again. And there appeared to be some items that were toys in the room, correct? Yes. And would, would you qualify them or, or uh, describe them as toys for uh, an infant or something else? All those toys were for, for a toddler or a, uh, um, I, I'd say, a, a child knowledge age. Right. So consistent with being for now. Yes. Next, I'm going to show you state exhibit number nine. Can you tell the jury your vantage point and what room we're looking into? <clears throat> this is the back bedroom. Um, this would be the bedroom we found Sterling. Um, I just pushed the door open just a little, as you can see, and took a picture of what I saw as I pushed the door open. And looking at State's Exhibit 9, can you just for the jurors' sake explain where would be the master bedroom in relation to that that room? Which wall would it be on? The, the master bedroom would be as if you, it would be on this wall over here. As if you come over on the, the fourth walls over here, it would be on that wall. And so how, how far apart are the room where Sterling was found and the master bedroom? They're, they're only divided by a wall. Um, there's only one wall between them. So to step from the doorway of the master bedroom to the doorway of the a child's bedroom where Sterling was found, how, how far is that? There were within, within steps, two to three steps. Thank you. Now the room where, where uh, you found Sterling, there appears to be some items on the floor on the left, correct? Correct. What are those? <clears throat> this here is that bouncy chair. Um, this goes with this swing as a set. Um, and how do you know that? Because I have the same, um, I have the same one. I knew that immediately after I saw it. Um, there's car seat right here, and then there's some uh, miscellaneous blankets and other items. There's a couple pop bottles that are empty right underneath the swing here. Um, there's one baby bottle. There's a baby blanket, and then um, there's some. I I told you earlier I smell sweet smelling candles, and those are them, along with the diapers that are rolled up. Now the blanket that's half hung on the wall or the quilt, what is that covering? That's covering the only window in the apartment, or in that bedroom, sorry, in that bedroom. And there appears to be below the quilt some sort of a register, what is that? They had in-floor heat in that apartment, that's what that is. So like a radiant heat? Yes. <clears throat> was the heat on? It was not. And you've already described that there was no fans in that room, correct? Correct. Now, our next look at State's Exhibit Number Ten. What is the item on the left uh, of State's Exhibit Number Ten? This is a full-size, or a um, again, I call it an adult because I don't know if it's full-size or clean, but it's a it's a full-size or clean-size mattress in a box spring. 
And is that lean against the wall to separate this room from the master bedroom? It is. And what is uh, the item that looks like yellow or, or orange, multicolored, and there seems to be some part of a cushion or something below it? What are those? This here is a baby blanket. That's a couch cushion. Um, this is a paper bag. Um, this is the car seat. And again, this is a chair. Um, the bouncy chair. Um, over here we got more, more of those rolled up diapers that I described. Um, there's some ointment. And then right here you can kind of see it, but this is the start of that pile of clothes that I described to you guys. And state exhibit number 11 I'm going to show you. What does that show? <clears throat> That's just me taking a couple more steps um, into the room and uh, basically from the same angle, just taking more steps into the room. Now you had mentioned a moment ago um, that you found some rolled up divers in, in that area and you kind of described what they were consistent with. Uh, is there one of those rolled up divers uh, under, or excuse me, next to the register on the floor? Yes, there is, right there. And going back to state's exhibit number 10, did you see some other diapers in that photograph? Yes, there's, there's that one, of course, and then we have this one, this one, and there's some right there. And again, those are diapers that were unused or unsoiled, correct? Correct, unused, unsoiled. And you said that you have cared for newborns in your uh, experience as a parent, correct? Yes, I have. Um, and are you confident that those were newborn size diapers? I am. There was one that was open, actually, um, and it's in one of our photographs, and it's a it's a newborn size. It also appears in State Exhibit 11 and some of the other photographs. There were some pop bottles, right? Correct. Was there anything in the pop bottles? There was not. Um, the reason I took those, I didn't know why they were there, um, so I took them to show that the adults had been in the room. I figured Nala didn't drink those. And above the, the pop bottles, there seems to be a dark colored item. What is that? Those are the, those are the blue pants <clears throat> that are uh, soaking urine underneath the swing. And the pink item above the blue pants? There's a, that pink item is a uh, baby blanket. The green item is a, a sheet. This is a, um, a dress that belongs, it would fit Nala. Um, and then again, this is the, the, uh, the only... So the pink baby blanket, the green sheet, and the blue pants showing the state's exhibit 11, were those the ones that were soaked in urine that you believe came from the swing? They are. I want to show you state's exhibit number 12. Does that show more as you face the swing to the right of the swing? It does. And what did you see in that area to the right of the swing? That's an open, that open diaper I was talking about, so how I, that's how I knew it was a newborn size and, and not, a, not a diaper for Nala. Um, I also saw that there was clothes here that um, were not for, the pile of clothes was not for um, a child that would be Sterling's size. They were more for Nala's size. And did you find any diaper ointment? I did. Um, or baby ointment? There's baby ointment right there. Would that be ointment that you could use for treatment of diaper rash? Correct. Now, next, uh, officer, I want to tell you that I'm going to show some photographs of the swing in Sterling, okay? Okay. And I'm going to start with number 13. Um, can you uh, describe uh, where the vantage point is for this photograph? <clears throat> this is me. Um, standing right beside him. He's facing so that the wall that has the blanket, or the, I'm sorry, the heavy quilt would be out here. Um, and I was standing right beside him. Now you had described earlier the, the items under the swing that were damp. Does this show a better idea of how they were underneath the holes in the swing? <laughs> yes, you can see, um, it's kind of hard in this picture, but the, that white clip right there is actually that three-point harness that I was telling you about. That's where they all come together. Um, where they would strap uh, Sterling in. Um, you can kind of see they're, they're really brown, but those used to be white straps. Um, those go down to the bottom, and there would be holes down there where those would come up. 
Now, officer, you mentioned earlier there was some scented smell that you heard, you smelled when you were there, and you described that there being some some uh, uh, fragrance plug-in, correct? Correct. Are they shown on this uh, uh, exhibit? They are. They're right down here on the uh, lower right corner. And were those packages sealed or opened, or would you describe them, please? Yeah, they were. They were unopened. Brand new. They, I would describe them as brand new. And how do those work? Are they placed in something to heat them up, or how does that work? They, uh, they, uh, there's a, they put them on a plate that is above a light bulb most of the time, and then those blocks will melt down and put scent in the air um, to cover a smell or to make the room smell better. Did you find any device like you described that could be used to heat those particular scented packages up? I did not. I found a candle um, in the kitchen that was lit, but I didn't find um, anything that would work with these. And they were uh, not open, but you could still smell them. Correct. Now, you mentioned earlier in your testimony that you had moved a blanket and, and you saw uh, insects come out, correct? Correct. Is that the multicolored blanket showing the stage exhibit 13 that was over Sterling? That is. That, uh, it's kind of a red, orange, and blue uh, look like blanket. Um, that's the one I moved and the, bu the bugs came out of there. Next, I'm going to show you state's exhibit number 14. What does that show? <clears throat> that shows what I saw. Um, that's Sterling's face, his spread blue eyes. It shows the, uh, the blood or body fluids coming out of his mouth. It shows the crusted and dried collar um, all the way around. He moved his head around. Um, it shows his hands clenched. <clears throat> it also shows lots of brown discoloring. Um, and I know that that's not, I have the swing. That's, that's dirt or urine or body fluid. So he had, he had moved. Um, that, that doesn't just, so that, that happened. Um, so it happened during the process. And can you show on exhibit number 14 which portion of Sterling's shirt that you touched? Touched him right down here, underneath the chin, and that entire collar would be as if he was a can of starch. The whole thing moved. And next, I'm going to show you state's exhibit number 15. Uh, that shows a little bit more of the covering that Sterling was laid on on the left of that photograph. Correct. Correct. This this is that. Uh, this should be that color. And. Uh, that's the same, I mean, that's the same cloth. That's the same covering of that chair. When you say it should be this color, you're, you're referring to the area that's directly above the discoloration to the left of Sterling's right arm. Correct. Correct. The, lightest, the lightest brown you can see is the color it's supposed to be. Was that area wet? It was. I next want to show you state exhibit number 16. Does that show how Sterling's hands uh, were configured? Yeah, the, uh, I took this picture um, to show that his hands were clenched. Um, he had he had blood on his uh, on his hands, so he had wiped his mouth at some point um, before he passed. Um, and that uh, rigor had set. When you say rigor, you mean his arms were stiff? Correct. Now, I next want to show you number 17. Is that Sterling's left arm? It is. And what are you trying to show with this photograph? <clears throat> what I'm trying to show here is the discoloration on his arm that was caused by the item he was sitting in, um, caused by the, the urine-soaked seat, um, and it had stained his arm. And the. The, uh, the hand wearing gloves is taking that photograph, is taking a hold of Sterling's arm, I should say. Is that your hand? That is my hand. Um, rigor had set so that his arm was, was hard to move, so I had to turn it just a little to get a good picture of the discoloration. Now, I'll next show you state's exhibit number 18. That kind of shows uh, the bottom portion of the sleeve, correct? Correct. Now, you had earlier described uh, what Sterling had on as far as uh, pants, right? Yes. Can you show his pants on state exhibit number 18? 
he had an army type pants on. Um, those would be right there. Could you tell if Sterling had a diaper on or not? I couldn't. Um, and I didn't move the blanket or the pants far enough to, to tell that. Now, there seems to be some discoloration down by Sterling's feet. Is that right? Yes. I have. I took this photo, and the reason was is because this discoloration shows that he was moving his feet, um, or what I believed he was moving his feet. So he had sat in that, or been there for a while, um, showing that the urine had had possibly accumulated or um, or been there for a while. That's right. I have one more photo that has Sterling in it. Uh, this is the last one Sterling in it. Can you tell the jury what that item is to the left uh, near the wall? This is the only baby bottle I found in that room. And exhibit number 20, is that a, a closer up photo of that baby bottle? Yes, it is. Now that baby bottle appears to have a, a line or something inside it, is that right? Yes. Now, obviously, as you talk, talked about earlier, you have some experiences with children, right? Yes. Do you know what that liner is inside the body? Um, sometimes that um, sometimes that liner can be used as uh, they premix the formula or as a way to heat the formula. Um, it can also be breast milk that they they froze and reheated later. Okay. Can you kind of describe the contents of the bottle? You had a chance to look at it. The, yeah, I, the bottle, the, um, the contents of the bottle itself had started to turn as I, um, I think that's what I put in my report, it started to turn and it, it uh, had basically divided into two separate layers, um, a fluid and a, and a churn kind of uh, pasty substance. So based on your experience, it looked like the bottle had been there for some period of time? Yes. And you don't know how long, right? No. Um, next, I'm going to show you space exhibit number 21. Is that another view of that bottle? Yes. Does that show some of the separation you were talking about? Yes. It, I got the, um, the fluid. You can you can tell a little bit, but it shows that it's really thick. It, it's really thick about <laughs> it started to turn, and it's basically turned into a, the stuff in here. Is basically solid, and um, stuff that's back down there is basically that clear substance. I want to turn back to uh, uh, the area of the swing, and, and this is a, a closer uh, up view of the area surrounding uh, Sterling. Did it appear to you that there were other items of clothing that were around Sterling's body? Yes, it did. It looked as if they had put other blankets or clothing underneath of him. And were those items uh, damp as well? Yes. Did they smell of urine? Yes, they did. And exhibit 23, those are the items underneath the swing that you talked about that were soaked with urine, correct? Yes. Uh, next, turn to number 24. We've kind of talked about this area before. That shows those, those uh, pop bottles and those scented uh, I correct? Correct. And 25, what does that show? This was um, that pile of clothes that I started um, that I was telling you about. There's a closet, there's a closet right over here um, that had clothing and different different attire, um, different, um, there's kind of some Tupperware dressers in there. Um, it shows this is, uh, got some wipes, there's some, there's some more clean boot and dingo ointment, which um, is like diaper rashes. There's one onesie right here, but even that, that um, I remember looking at the size and that size wasn't the correct size, um, but it was close. Um, but most of the clothes in this um, pile are for Nala, or child Nala size. Looking at this photograph 25, where would the swing be in relation to this photograph? In this photograph, you can see that um, the plug-in's right there, and that's the, that's the plug-in for the swing itself. In the swing, you can kind of see the back side of the heel, so one of the legs is right there. So um, if you think of it like a two-prong, it's sitting right like that, up in that corner, <coughs> towards like facing the corner. 
And next show you see is exhibit number 26. What does that show? That's that closet that I was telling you about. It has the Tupperware dressers. Um, a lot of the stuff in it, um, a lot of the doors were empty and then had them pulled out. Um, there's some adult clothes we found. Um, again, most of the clothing we found in this pile or in this room were dollars. And next I'm going to show you state's exhibit number 27. What, what room in the house is that? This is the kitchen. Um, so this would be, if you walk into the apartment, it would be right off to the right. Now, officer, did you look through the entire apartment that day? I did. And you mentioned that you found the one bottle in the room, the baby bottle in the room with the liner where Sterling was found, correct? Yes. Did you find any of those liners anywhere else in the house? I did not. Uh, did you find any other baby bottles anywhere else in the house? I found one other baby bottle um, above the sink. Okay. And looking at number, exhibit 27, would the area where the baby bottle was found be shown? Yes, it's, there's, a, there's a small half cupboard up here with doors in it. Now, it appears that uh, in the sink there is some soapy water, correct? Yes. Can you describe what you saw? Inside the soapy water, there was, of course, dishes, but there was a, um, a sippy cup um, in there for a child knowledge. age. And did it appear that dishes had been done recently? Yes. And looking at number 28, does that show what you saw? Yes. And to be clear, were there any baby bottles that were in the kitchen sink being washed? No, they were sippy cups. Uh, next, I want to show you state exhibit number 29. Where is this in the kitchen, sir? This is that uh, that uh, cupboard I told you is right above the sink. Um, it, uh, it's just kind of one of those half cupboards with the doors on it. And does this show, uh, State Exhibit 29, the bottle that you described finding, finding before? Yes, this is the only other bottle I found in the apartment other than the one in the baby's room. And was that bottle clean? It was. And is that a larger or full-size bottle, larger than the one that was found in Sterling's room? It's, I think it's uh, just built differently. It's, it's, uh, it's an older bottle, older style. The uh, one that was in um, Sterling's room is, is uh, kind of a newer style for the liner. Now there appears to be some cans uh, uh, shown there on the left of Exhibit 29, correct? Yes. What are those? These are both formula different kinds. And did you look inside the cans? I did. And what did you find? The, uh, the blue sunlac that's up front, um, I found that to be about three quarters full. And then um, the orange one that's in the back, that, um, it's, it's kind of a, an off label, but it's for sensitivity. Um, that was more like a third full or a quarter, under a quarter I'd say. And is this the powdered formula that you mix with water to make the baby bottles? It is. And were these where they were located when you found them? That is exactly as if I opened the cupboard and took a picture. And later were they moved? Yes, I moved them to, to, to look through them and take pictures. But 29 shows where they were found? Yes. Now next I'm going to show you stage exhibit number 30. Where is that? That's in the kitchen. Um, I, I took that photograph um, because there's garbage bags, um, and I, at that time I still hadn't found a garbage can. And did you eventually find a garbage can in the apartment? I did. And where did you find it? I found the garbage can in the tub. Um, it had been washed clean. It still had water in it. Did it have a garbage bag in it? <coughs> it did not. Did you find any other garbage bags in the apartment full of trash or anything? I did not. During your entire search of the apartment, did you find any used or soiled or wet diapers? There was, n there was not one in the entire apartment. In state's exhibit number 31, what does that show? That was after I found the trash can. Uh, it's, it's in the tub. They had washed it out. And did it still have some water in it? It did. Now next I want to show you state's exhibit number 32. What does that show? This is... Um, so. This would be as if we're, we're at the, the place where we decide to go in the baby's room or the master bedroom, and we're pushing open the master bedroom door and just taking a picture. And would the far right of that photograph show the entrance way to Sterling's room? Yeah, the um, Sterling's room is literally right, the, you can see the trim right there. 
Now there appears to be a, a box fan there, correct? Yes. Was that pointed to draw air out of the room or to draw air into the room? It was blowing the cooler air from the living room into the bedroom. Was the fan uh, operating or moving? It was not. There also appears to be, uh, it looks like a pack in play, correct? Yes. And this was again in the master bedroom, right? Yes. Turning to state's exhibit number 33, what does that show? This was just, um, again, I, I take a lot of photographs when I work the scene, so it's just me taking another step and turning as I'm going. Uh, so this was showing that the, the bed had some phones and some I, I, um, electronics on them that showed that there was some um, some clothing in the, in the uh, and it also showed that there's a door to a closet. Now on the left of that photograph, I know you can't see it, but was there a shelf with a bookcase? Yeah. Or a bookcase there, with a shelf? There's a very small void between this. This is the door to walk into the bedroom. And there's a very small space between the, behind that, between um, between basically the outside wall of the apartment or the, the bedroom and then the closet. And there was a book uh, bookshelf there. And was there a purse on that bookshelf? There was. Did you look in the purse? I did. Could you tell whose purse it was? Yes. How could you tell that? Identification. And whose identification was in the purse? Cheyenne Harris. And in that purse, did you find a receipt? I did. And where was the receipt located in that purse? It was, um, it was underneath the purse. It was inside the purse underneath the billfold. And um, that receipt was from a business? Yes, it was. What business was it from? It was from Hyde Food Stores in Charles City, Iowa. And I assume during your course of your life living in Iowa, you've had a chance to shop at Hyde Bean, right? Yes. Was the receipt that you saw a type of receipt that you had received in the past when you purchased items at Hyde Bean? Yes. Um, and you've seen that receipt or copy of it before today, correct? Yes. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I offer state exhibit number 91 in evidence. Any objection to 91? No, Your Honor. It is admitted. And, sir, I'll get back to this in a second, so I'm just going to put it up here on the, uh, the area by your seat. And I want to finish these photographs, all right? Let's go to, we have two photographs left, number 34. Uh, what does that show, sir? I was taking a picture of the packing play, um, which has multiple uh, blankets in there. Um, they, again, those weren't the, I wouldn't call them baby blankets, but they were like the in-between size of, not, not quite a twin bed, but a, uh, a toddler size blanket. And number 35, what does that show? Just another view, it shows the, the uh, multiple blankets and the, there's actually an adult sheet in there um, and then there's actually, it's hard to see, but there's some stuffed animals. When you were in the master bedroom uh, and looking at the items in the pack and play, um, were they soiled or wet or dirty in any way? They were not. <coughs> Thank you, sir. You can take your seat. Marley, you can turn the lights back on, please. I'll we'll recover that. <laughs> now, sir, if you would take out the exhibit 91 that I need to see, I just have a couple questions for you, okay? Okay. Um, can, you, can you tell the jury what date those items were purchased from High V that are shown on that receipt? Um. The date shows August 26, 2017, at 6.14 p.m. And does it show the location of the store where the items were purchased from High V? It shows the address is 901 Kelly Street, Charles City, Iowa, and then it supplies a telephone number and an email address. Can you give the jury a sense from the apartment where you found this receipt in Alta Vista, how far is it to Charles City? As I stated, in our, uh, Alta Vista is kind of a rural uh, town up in the corner of our county. Um, New Hampton would be in the center of our county. 
it'd be the biggest town in our county, but Charles City would be the county seat of the next county, and it's kind of, it literally, Alta Vista's kind of in the middle of those two. Um, we have a blacktop that's called the Cowell Blacktop. It's a county road, but it'll take you right from um, uh, Alta Vista to Charles City, and it's probably 12, 14 miles. And so how much does the receipt, receipt show was spent on purchasing items at High V on August 26, 2017 at 6.14 p.m.? On that day, they purchased $123.52. Thank you. When you looked through that apartment that day, uh, did you find any evidence that there had been a pet in the apartment? Yes, I did. What did you find? I found numerous um, shampoos and conditioners for a dog in the bathroom. Um, I also found a big bag of dog food behind the door um, and other supplies. When you say behind the door, what door was it behind? It was actually, if you walk into the apartment itself, it's right to the left, right by the main door of the apartment. Did you find food bowls and things like that? They were, they were, there were some in the bag almost, I don't know if they were scooping that out, um, but um, I don't remember actually seeing the actual food dishes themselves because they had moved the dog before we got there. So when you arrived, did you find a dog in the apartment? No. And you said the dog had been moved, what do you mean? They, uh, I, was, I was told that um, they took it to a um, neighbor's because they weren't sure how it would act. Now after you took your photographs and did uh, your efforts that you described to, to uh, um, document the crime scene, what did you do next? Then. I secured the scene, as I stated. All non-law enforcement personnel were, I, I made them leave, um, and I started my um, log. And were you present when the uh, DCI uh, agents came to assist your agency in processing this crime scene? Yes, I was. And it appears uh, from the reports that they arrived at about 6.40 p.m., is that right? It sounds about right. Did you assist Special Agent Jim Teal with his work in, in processing and document, documenting this crime scene? Yes, I did. I informed him that I had um, already taken photographs and other um, and done other items of investigatory um, investigation, and he um, we went back through what I had done and started um, what he needed to do. And it looks like that you assisted Special Agent Teal in doing some temperature readings at about 8.45 p.m., correct? Correct. Can you tell the jury, was the temperature in the apartment similar to when you were there earlier that day, or was it different? I don't recall. I remember, I remember that, that the room in question, the, the room for, that the baby was in, was still warmer, um, but I don't remember... Um, if it was, because it had started to get, it started to cool down because it was about 8.45, so it's, um, when we first got there, of course, it's high noon. Um, so I think the apartment had started to cool down a little bit. Um, you know what time you left the, the property that day? It was um, sometime after 11 p.m. And did that uh, end your involvement in this matter? It did, yes. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Do you know if any effort was made uh, to go to the High V where those purchases were made to obtain video from High V to see who made those purchases? No, I don't know that. Um, in your experience, uh, do you have knowledge that Hy-Vee does have video cameras at their stores? I believe they do, yes. And it's not unusual, is it, for law enforcement when they're investigating, say, to verify somebody's whereabouts or to see who's with whom, uh, to subpoena or obtain video from any number of establishments, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, do you know if any effort was made in this investigation at all to do that related to that hy -Vee? I don't. I don't know. So we don't know, uh, you wouldn't know if, if Ms. Harris made the purchases, if Mr. Cohen made the purchases, or who was at that high beat when that receipt was obtained. Correct. I can only tell you where I found the receipt. And the receipt um, shows food items that were purchased, correct? Correct. And did you document uh, those food items existing at that apartment? 
I did not, um, but I believe the DCI agent might have. There might have been pictures taken. Correct. Mr. Counselor, can you put up number 33? Yes, sir. Exhibit, state's exhibit number 33, officer. Is there a blanket on the window in that room as well? That's, yes, there is. Okay. Um, did you find any curtains uh, behind that blanket? I don't recall. Okay. And the same as the room that Sterling was found in, do you know if there were curtains behind that? There actually um, was plastic. Okay. Was what, clear plastic? Correct. So the fact that there was a blanket over a window was not something that was unique to the room that Sterling was found in, correct? As opposed, I guess I don't. Well, there's a blanket on that window as well, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, I'm looking at that photo in the bed that's in, in there. There appears to be what I would say are cell phones. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and do you know the owners of those cell phones? I wasn't in charge of that part of the investigation. Okay. Um, as part of the investigation, though, uh, did you become aware of who lived at this apartment? I did. Okay. And who were those individuals? Cheyenne Harris and... Um, Zachary Cohn. Those were the two adults? Yes. And part of your investigation, walking through that apartment and taking pictures, you're able to identify items of clothing? Yes. And you documented items of clothing that would um, be available for, say, a toddler? Yes. Did you also document items of clothing that would be available uh, or appropriate for Ms. Harris? Yes. Did you also uh, find articles of clothing that would have been appropriate for Mr. Cohn? Yes. Okay. Is it fair to say in your investigation, the photographs that you, you took, it was consistent with Mr. Cohn and Ms. Harris living there with their children? Yes. The baby bottle that was found in Sterling's room, did you open that to examine the contents? I did not. Uh, was there moisture in it? It was. There was fluid in there, yes. So there was at least movement in when you observed it? Yes. Would it be part of your investigation to determine if there were fingerprints on that bottle? No, there wouldn't. It wouldn't be mine. Let me ask the same about the uh, pop bottles that were found in Sterling's room. Do you know if those were dusted for fingerprints? No, I don't believe they were, but uh, I don't even think they collected them. Okay. You don't believe that those bottles were collected? I don't think so. So they never made their way to evidence? I don't think so. Um, there were at least three individuals that were uh, capable of movement on their own at that apartment, correct? Nala, Zachary, and, and Cheyenne? Yes. Okay. And um, in your experience with toddler, toddlers, it wouldn't be unusual for a toddler, I had some of my own back in the day, uh, to move pop bottles and things like that. They become toys as well, correct? Correct. Um, the same would be true with those little scented things that were down there. You have no knowledge of whether Nala was playing with those or if they were moved there by an adult, correct? I have no knowledge of that, no. Was Sterling secured in the three-point harness in that seat? Yes, he was. You, you did uh, say that rigor had settled in, but you don't have any knowledge as to how long it takes for rigor to set in, do you? Correct. I'm not an expert, no. Okay, and that's probably something best left to talk to the medical examiner, fair? Yes. Thank you, sir. Redirect. Um, can I talk about putting this bed room in this record? Yes. Uh, Debbie, Debbie, can you just describe the plastic that was covering the window in Sterling's room? What do you mean by that? Uh, again, it's it's just kind of a um, it's a winter guard plastic that they put up there to I suppose to for the winter to keep the the uh, air out. And when you walked into the living room, those windows were not covered by blankets, were they? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. No, I don't. I'd have to look through, back through the pictures to be sure, but I don't believe they were. And you have in front of you, sir, uh, those photographs. Why don't you look at state's exhibit uh, number um, six, I believe, and seven.
Yeah, they didn't have blankets on them. They had blinds. Thank you. Nothing further. Nothing, Your Honor. This witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Officer, you may step down. <laughs> State's next witness. State calls Jeremy McGrath. Counsel, I am unable to log into the to ISIS right now for some reason. I don't know why. So I'm not able to admit the exhibits electronically, so we may go through them afterwards so we can identify exactly what's in and what is not. Hopefully I'll be back up and running, but for now I'm not. Come forward. Raise your right hand. You promised testimony about to give me the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Have a seat. Ms. Timmons. Would you please introduce yourself to the jury? Jeremy McGrath. Where do you work at? I am a uh, owner and paramedic. Um, I own a private ambulance service in Chickasaw County, Chickasaw Ambulance Service. How long have you owned that? Ten years in May. Can you tell us a little about your business and what you do? Um, I run ambulance calls and also do the management as aspect of the business um, on top of doing the patient care. Do you have medical training? Yes, I do. What is that? I have gone through the EMT course. I have done the paramedic program through Hawkeye Community College in Waterloo and uh, done thousands of hours of continuing education over my 17 years. You also work as a medical examiner and investigator, correct? I did up until December of, of 2018. And tell us about that. Um, Basically what our job there is to, we get called by dispatch for deaths uh, within our county and it's to collect and gather preliminary information for the state medical examiner's office and our chief medical examiner. How long have you done that? Um, almost two years. Right, I'd like to talk to you about August 30th, 2017. Were you paged out to a residence regarding an infant that day? Yes, I was. What time? Um, it was approximately uh, 1 p.m.-ish, noon or 1 p.m. Where were you when you received the page? I was north of New Hampton at my dad's business. About how far is that from Alta Vista? Uh, approximately 12 miles. Uh, so you received this page and what did you do? I uh, got in my pickup truck and I have uh, emergency lights in it. It is a uh, licensed emergency vehicle since I own the service as a paramedic response unit and I activated my lights and drove to the scene. You went to 107 South Hilltop in Alta Vista? Correct. But how long did it take you to get to town? Approximately 10 to 12 minutes. All right, when you arrived, what did you see? I was greeted by a postal worker, and uh, she led me to an apartment. Was that Tina Shattuck? Correct. Okay. And uh, she was a little bit frantic. Um, well, we, we were dispatched, uh, the nature of the call was an infant not breathing. So it was kind of a escalation of, of urgency there. And uh, she led me to the apartment, and uh, when I walked in the apartment, she stayed outside, and as I walked in the apartment, I could visualize uh, Tony Fredericks, who's another first responder, and MEI, and she was in the bedroom ahead of me. What did you do? I walked into the apartment, and uh, to my left was another bedroom, and in that bedroom was a male and a female, adult male and adult female, and a young child, a girl, and uh, they were talking. I do not recollect what they were talking about. I was focused on the incident, and so I walked past that room 
and approached Tony and she kind of filled me in of what she had observed up until that point. So let me back you up a little bit. You said that you walked into, you were walking towards the bedroom where Tony was, correct? Correct. And in a different bedroom you saw two adults and a child. Correct. How, how close are those bedrooms to each other? The, the, the bedroom that the adult and the child are in is right here and the, the uh, bedroom that Tony was in is right next to it. So, eight. You say that those two adults were talking in that room? Correct. Um, I assume at that point, though, your main concern was getting to the baby. Correct. When you got there, you said that Tony briefed you or told you of the situation. Correct. What did you observe and see at the scene after Tony described to you her thoughts? Um, I observed a infant um, in a swing and the uh, infant was cold and wet. Um, there was blood present on the infant's mouth and right hand. Um, obviously deceased. When you say obviously deceased, what do you mean by that? Um, the baby was cold. I did the farthest I went with the assessment was um, I touched the baby's forehead to visualize its eyes um, and I lifted his left arm and it was cold and stiff. When you say the arm was stiff, uh, in your training experience, what does that mean? Uh, rigor mortis. What is rigor mortis? Rigor mortis is a, a stage um, of death that a person's muscle goes through after dying. Is there a particular time frame that you usually see rigor mortis? From my experience, it's typically 12 to 24 hours, and it, it kind of depends on each case and the circumstances. You mean 12 to 24 hours after death? Correct. Did the baby have anything covering them? Yes, that baby had some blankets and clothing um, on his lap. What did the room feel like to you? Very warm. Did it feel different than the room that, that you had walked into originally? In yeah, absolutely. It was much warmer. Um, there was a bed in there that was laying up against the wall. Um, the swing was facing the wall in the opposite direction of the doorway. So as I walk in, I'm facing east, and the outside wall is ahead of me, and the swing was facing that outside wall. Was there any air circulation in the room? I didn't see any fans. Um, the only source of heat I noticed in the room was a baseboard heater, what appeared to be an electric heater. What did it smell like to you? Um, it was an odor that I don't recognize. And I've been on a considerable amount of death calls over my 17 years in EMS, and typically there's a distinct odor of somebody that has been deceased, and it didn't smell like that to me. I don't know if it was a, the urine, um, a urinish smell, but it's not a smell that I recognized. Something you hadn't encountered before? Correct. When you were observing Sterling, did you see any insects? Yes, I did. What did you see? So it appeared to be gnats um, crawling on his clothing and the, in the wet um, blankets on him. Was there any flying around as well? Yes, there was. I assume you did not attempt any type of medical inter intervention with Sterling? No, I did not. Law enforcement was notified? Correct. Were you present when they arrived? I was. What did you do when they arrived? Um, I met Reed Palo at the door, uh, Deputy Palo, and I briefed him on what I observed, and um, then he went in the, and I guess I don't know what he did after he went in, but um, I briefed him as he approached the building. After you spoke with Deputy Palo, what did you do? 
I went to my vehicle and got my paperwork that I need to do um, for the MEI report and uh, waited outside of the apartment. You said the MEI report. What is that? MEI one form is a form that we fill out. Um, basic demographic information, information of our findings on a scene, and the state medical exam. It gets hit, sent to the state medical examiner's office, and they use that to assist them in their um, study or investigation. Did you speak to anyone to assist you in filling out that form? I did. I spoke to Cheyenne Harris. When you spoke with Cheyenne Harris, what was her demeanor? Um, she seemed normal. Um, it's my opinion that she didn't show a state of emotion. Um, she talked to me in a normal manner, um, or responded to my questions appropriately. Did she appear to be impaired or under the influence in any way? In my opinion, no, she did not. And I assume with the type of job you have, you deal with that, come across people that are under the influence quite a bit. I do. Right. When you spoke with Cheyenne Harris, uh, did she provide to you the baby's name? She did. And what did she tell you? Sterling Cohn. And that's K-O-E-H-N? Correct. Did she tell you that Sterling's date of birth was May 1st, 2017? She did. Um, and what day were you there on at the house? What's that? What day were you at the house? I believe it's August 30th of 2017. Okay. So at that time, Sterling was three months and 30 days old? Correct. Did she provide you any explanation as to what had happened? She did not. The only thing she told me, I asked her when she last seen Sterling alive, because that's one of the questions on the MEI form is when the patient was last seen alive. And she told me that she last seen him alive at 2,000 hours, which is 8 p.m. the previous night. Now, you said 2,000 hours. Did Cheyenne Harris use the, the phrase 2,000 hours? No, she said 8 p.m. Sorry, we use military time. So in speaking with Cheyenne, with the defendant, Cheyenne Harris, the last time that she observed Sterling, according to what she told you, was 8 o'clock the night before. Correct. And what, about what time did you arrive at their house that day? I'd say it's about 1 p.m. That's all I have. Cross. No question, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Hobbaker? Yes. Mr. McGrath, you are free to go. The state's next witness. The state will call Sheriff Martin Keenan, Your Honor. Sir, if you could please state your first and last name and spell them both for the record. My name is Martin Heenan. First name is M-A-R-T-I-N. Last name H-E-M-A-N-N. -N. And sir, it's probably obvious from your attire here today, but what is your profession, sir? I am the sheriff of Chickasaw County. And how many years experience do you have in law enforcement? A little over 30 years now. Can you describe for the jury, first of all, your educational background that qualified you to be the sheriff? Yes, I have a uh, two-year degree in police science, and that was from 1986 to 1988, Hawkeye Community College. I have an uh, Associates of Applied Arts degree. And then later in 1988, I attended the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy. And over the course of the last 30 years, I've taken numerous different uh, um, classes, if you will, in law enforcement. 
And are you a certified peace officer here in the state of Iowa? Yes, I am. Now, you say you have 30 plus years total experience in law enforcement. How many of those years have been at the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office? I was hired in Chickasaw County in July of 1990. And have you held different positions since 1990, ending up as the sheriff? Yes, I was hired as a deputy sheriff July 1990. And uh, then in 2012, I would have been appointed chief deputy. And then in 2013, I was appointed the jail administrator. And then in November of 2016, I was elected by the people to be sheriff. And sir, as the sheriff, how many employees or deputies work under your direction as the sheriff? Uh, currently, we have, including myself, uh, 10 certified uh, peace officers. Um, a couple of years, we just increased that number from 9 to 10 just in the last year. And what does it mean to be a sheriff? What, what are your responsibilities and duties? Well, I uh, oversee a lot of different aspects of the sheriff's office. I uh, do the uh, annual budget. I meet with the supervisors. I attend city council meetings. I do a lot of the scheduling, training, things like that. Um, I also do respond to calls in uh, the county as well. So you're not just an administrator. You also handle calls and, and show up and deal with issues that arise in your county. Yes, I do. Now, sir, on August 30th, 2017, were you working that day? Yes, I was. And where were you physically located when the 911 call came in that there was an issue with an infant in Alta Vista, Iowa? I would have been at the sheriff's office. And what did you do in response to the call coming in, or, or how did you learn about it first, I guess? Uh, dispatch had relayed um, to all the officers that were working about a uh, emergent call in Alta Vista. And so from the sheriff's office, I responded up to Alta Vista. And did you respond as you're dressed today in a police uniform? Yes, I did. And why was it that you as a sheriff responded? Uh, given the nature of the call and the uh, um, serious nature of the call, uh, I didn't feel that it would be uh, right for just one deputy to respond uh, so myself, uh, Deputy Jason Russell, and Chief Deputy Reed Palo all responded at the same time. Were you familiar with that apartment complex in Alta Vista prior to going there that day? Yes. I assume there's probably not a building in Chickasaw County you're not familiar with in some way. Most of them I am, yes. Okay. Um, and, sir, when you went uh, to the residence, um, did, you, did you park at the apartment complex? Yes, there are a couple different buildings there, uh, three of them that I can think off the top of my head, and I would have parked um, center to the, all three of them. I would have parked uh, to the north of the uh, one where we were dispatched to. And if your report says that you arrived at the apartment complex at 1.14 p.m., would that be accurate? Yes, it would. And when you arrived at the apartment complex, what did you see? Um, there was a few people outside of the apartment complex. The first person that I had uh, met or recognized would have been the Elder Vista Fire Chief, and his name is uh, Kevin Hupka. And he, did he direct you where to go? Yeah, he pointed to the building and uh, told me which apartment building it was. Now, prior to that day, August 30th, 2017, did you know the defendant, Cheyenne Harris? No, I did not. Did you know her live-in boyfriend, Zachary Cohn? No, I did not. Did you know their baby, Sterling Cohn? No, I did not. Or their other child, Nala? No, I did not. Um, did you actually go into the uh, apartment complex? Yes, I did. Did you go into apartment number seven? Yes. When you went into the apartment, what did you observe? Well, when I first walked in there, um, off to my right is uh, where the kitchen area would have been and Chief Deputy Reed Palo was crouched down and was talking to who I later learned was uh, Cheyenne Harris. And did you learn that there was another male in the residence? Yes, I did. And where was that male located? He would have been located in a back bedroom. It would have been, there was two bedrooms in the apartment. It would have been in the northeast corner of the apartment. Would that be the bedroom that did not contain Sterling's body? Yes. And did, who is this man? What's his name? His name was uh, Zachary Cohen. And did you interact with him? Yes, I did. 
And where did you interact with him? Back in that bedroom. When you went in the bedroom, was he alone or with somebody else? Uh, he was with a uh, small girl. Was that his daughter and the defendant's daughter, Nala? Yes, it would have been. Can you describe her? Uh, she was not quite two years old, um, dark hair, uh, clothed uh, appropriately. I mean, she looked healthy to me, and, um, you know, she was, um, she was not fussing or anything like that. Was she communicative with words or able to talk with words? I really did not talk to her. She didn't uh, really communicate much with me. Did she appear to be injured in any way? No, she didn't. And you've already said that she was properly clothed, is that correct? Yes. Did she appear to be properly nourished? Yes, she did. Uh, did she appear to be in good health? Yes, she did. Did you notice anything about her appearance that caused you any concern? No, there was nothing that uh, caused me any concern. And you were able to uh, uh, interact and observe uh, Nala in the same room, correct? Yes. That day, sir, were you equipped with a body camera? Yes, I was. What, what is a body cam? It is a, a small device that uh, all of the deputies in our department have on them. Um, I typically would mount mine on my chest here, and uh, it is a uh, camera that has a fisheye lens that uh, you can see quite a bit of uh, degree of angle in the room, and it has both audio and videotape. And in this case, did you, in fact, uh, using that body camera, record video of Nala has, as she appeared that day? Yes, I did. And have you re uh, reviewed prior today State's Exhibit number 36, which is about a two-minute clip of video, no audio, of Nala that day? Yes, I did. And is she uh, seated or on the lap of her father, Mr. Cohn? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I move for the admission of State's Exhibit 36. Okay. 36 is admitted. Permission to publish. Any objection? And again, this is a uh, hard exhibit and not something you've uploaded. Is that correct, Mr. McAllister? It is, Your Honor. DVD, I'm assuming? Pardon? DVD or flash drive? Yes. DVD, okay. And if I can just... No, I'm good. Lights back up. Um, Sheriff, having watched State's Exhibit Number 36 and being present that day with Nala, 
Is there anything that you observed either in her uh, behaviors or how she appeared that suggested that she was anything but a normal, happy, typical two-year-old? No. At one point she had something in her hand. What was that? I guess I'm not quite sure what that was. Uh, something long like that that she was just kind of waving around. And it looked like her mouth was moving. Was she talking or just babbling? I think she was just kind of babbling. Now, sir, um, after you arrived at the apartment, did you and the other law enforcement officers eventually uh, lock down the apartment? Yes, we did secure the apartment. And what was the purpose in doing that? Um, basically, when we had, uh, when I had talked with the other deputies, Chief Deputy uh, Palo that was on scene and uh, Chief De or, uh, Deputy Jason Russell, um, we determined that this could be a potential crime scene and so that we would want to preserve the scene as best that we can so that nothing would be coming in or coming out of there um, until we could obtain the search warrant. And did you want to secure the scene so it could be searched and inventoried and examined more thoroughly? Yes. And did you provide security at that apartment? Yes, I did. Did anybody besides law enforcement come in and out of that apartment uh, mm -hmm. after you arrived and posted that security? No. And what time did the DCI agents uh, arrive to, uh, uh, well, let me ask you a different way. Your report says that DCI agents arrived at about 6.30 p.m. to process the crime scene, correct? That would be accurate, yes. Did anybody enter that was not law enforcement between the time you arrived until the DCI arrived? No. Was the integrity of that crime scene preserved? Yes, it was. And what time approximately did you leave that apartment that day? It would have been about 10.30 or shortly after that. And were you there to be uh, security for the apartment? Yes, I was. Sir, did that pretty much end your involvement in this matter? Yes, it did. Thank you, sir. That's all the questions that I have. Mr. Hallbaker. Thank you, Your Honor. When you were uh, speaking with uh, Mr. Cohen in the back bedroom and observing Nala, Ms. Harris was in the kitchen with Reed Palo, is that correct? When I first came into the apartment building, Chief Deputy Reed Palo was in the kitchen area with Cheyenne. Then when I went into the uh, back bedroom, I guess I'm not sure how long she was in there, yes. Fair enough, that's an accurate answer. I yeah. get it, but you did observe uh, Cheyenne uh, in the kitchen when you initially came in? Yes. So you were able to see her demeanor? Yes. And uh, did you observe her as crying? Yes, I did. Did you observe her as being uh, upset? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Redirect? Nothing for me, Your Honor. This will just be excused. Yes, Your Honor. Sir, you may step down. Thank you. You can leave. Next witness. I was just telling Barb we'll probably go about 15 more. That'll kind of split our time. Does anybody need a break right now? If not, we'll go about 15 more minutes with Deputy Palo and then take a recess for the end run. Okay. But if you do, let me know, okay? Testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do, Your Honor. I have a seat. Ms. Timmons. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? I'm Reed Palo. Where do you work at? I work for the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been there? I began with them in 2001. Uh, and what is your title there? I'm currently the Chief Deputy. What does that mean to be a chief deputy? I'm pretty much the right hand for the sheriff, um, handle administrative duties and pretty much oversee all the operations within the agency. We're a small agency, so I also do uh, criminal investigation as well. How many years have you had in law enforcement? I've been full-time in Iowa for 21 years, coming up on 22. Um, then I worked for an additional well, since 1985, I've been an either reserve officer or part-time officer. 
Can you tell us the different jobs that you've held in law enforcement? Uh, I started as a sergeant, mm -hmm. as a reserve officer up in the Twin Cities. At the, at the time, I also worked full-time in detox in Minneapolis uh, as a chemical, chemical dependency technician. Then I ran a group home um, in Duluth, Minnesota. I was a reserve officer there as well. Um, since being with the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office, I've gotten to wear a lot of different hats. I was a canine officer for 10 years, taught DARE, um, done investigations pretty much since I was hired there in 2001. My relationship with several of the Chickasaw County deputies was formed before I came there, um, working joint investigations and working with the Narcotics Task Force and, and having taught DARE. So I, they knew me before they hired me pretty much. So. You went to the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy? I did. Do you have any other educational background or training? Ongoing education and training as a drug recognition expert and as uh, in investigations and criminal, pro criminal scene, crime scene processing and things like that. I've, I've continued to, to gather education as I've gone along. You're a certified peace officer in the state of Iowa? I am. Right, where is the sheriff's office located? New Hampton, Iowa. And New Hampton, is that the county seat in Chickasaw County? It is. Would that make it the largest city in Chickasaw County? Yes. How big is New Hampton? Uh, well, within city limits, about 3,500, but there's about 4,500 right in the, the local community there. Is Chickasaw County fairly rural? Yeah, 600 and some square miles. There's 12,000 people, roughly. Um, lots of farming. I'd like to talk to you about August 30th, 2017. You were working that day? I was. What day of the week was that? Would have been a Wednesday. Did you overhear a 911 call come in about a deceased infant? Yes, I was actually at our county attorney's office. Often in the course of my job, I meet with the county attorney on a regular basis. And I was just leaving their office, and I was in the drive um, pulling back out. Their office is actually outside of city limits. It's one of those place is right close to town, but it's just outside of city limits to the north. And uh, I heard the page come out, and my phone rang at the same time from my office saying, hey, you need to start this way um, for a, a deceased or unresponsive four-month-old infant. What did you do? Um, drove. I was on the north side of town already, and Alta Vista is actually in the northwest corner of our county. So I drove as quickly as I could up to the to the location of the call, um, arrived there about seven minutes later. You were sent to 107 South Hilltop apartment number seven, is that correct? Yes. And that address, that residence is in Chickasaw County? Yes. You said it took seven minutes to get there? Seven, seven and a half, something like that. Uh, when you pulled up, where did you park at? Um, just outside of the alleyway. Um, there's an alley that runs um, behind the three, I have to explain. There's three apartment buildings, 12 units, four apartments in each unit, uh, and uh, there's an alleyway that's behind there with a parking area where you nose in off the alley. So I parked down at the end of the alley. Did you know? Had you been there before? Did you know which apartment you were going to? I didn't know which actual apartment I was going to, but I think there's only one actual apartment building in Alta Vista. It's not a not a large town. So what did you do when you got there? Um, I ran around the building into the central courtyard area, which is kind of where everyone funnels into those buildings. And I was directed, I asked, um, where are they? Um, there was a lady standing outside um, who directed me to the center apartment. Do you know who that was? And I later learned it was Jennifer Shriver. And that is? Jennifer lives in the first building on the left. Um, and she's a... Actually, I learned later that she had provided babysitting for the Cohen Harris family. So she was a resident of the apartment complex? Yep. Yes, she lived in that first apartment on the left, in the left-hand building. So you went into the apartment where, uh, where the emergency personnel were, correct? Correct. What's the first thing you noticed when you walked into that apartment? Well, even before getting into the actual apartment, I was met with... Uh, a fairly strong odor of feces and, and urine. At that time, was the apartment door open? It was. It was ajar. Open to the hallway? Yes. You go into the apartment. What do you do? 
as I'm coming into the apartment, um, Kevin Hupka, who's the acting fire chief for the city of Alta Vista, was coming from one of the back bedrooms, and he acknowledged me, and he directed me back um, to that bedroom, and I just, we kind of met. I don't even know if we spoke necessarily, but he was like, you know, just directed me back there. A um, little peculiar that he was coming away. I mean, I, I had anticipated arriving to find them working on a patient um, or providing care. Uh, continued on and then on the, as I was, I mean, it's not a huge apartment. From the, actually from outside of the apartment, you can look through the apartment and see right into the, the bedroom where Sterling was found. Um, but just outside of that bedroom door was Tina Shadek, Cheyenne Harris, and, and Zach Cohen. All, I didn't know who they were at the time, but later identified as those people. Um, so you go back to the to the room, correct? Yes. Were you the first law enforcement officer there? Yes. When you went back to the room, what did you do? Um, well, I, uh, Jeremy McGrath was standing there, and as was Tony Frederick, um, and they they weren't doing anything as far as resuscitation efforts. They were just looking down at the swing. Um, it was odd because I couldn't see the baby. The swing was turned away from the door towards the exterior wall. Um, so they're standing, you know, on the other side. So they were able to see the baby at that point. I, I couldn't. I could just see their faces. Um, and they weren't trying to do anything with the baby. Um, and uh, they both, both basically indicated that this wasn't for them. It was for me um, as far as the call. That something I needed to investigate. So... When you went into the baby's room, or where the baby was, what did it feel like? It was stifling is one word I've used. It was heavy, stale, kind of an oppressive air. And it was a combination of the no air movement and that stale, uh, horrible smell of feces and urine. Like, um, just really strong and oppressive. And there was just no air movement. It felt very hot. Um, was the smell worse in that room? Yeah, as I, I mean, literally every breath I took from the time I came into the hallway, into the apartment, it got worse. As I came through the apartment, it got worse. And by the time I got to the bedroom, it was overpowering. It was, it was uh, I don't know if I gagged. I mean, I don't know if I got, I, I'm, I'm not, not usually affected by odors all that much. Um, but in that room, it was, it was like you didn't want to breathe. <laughs> Did you see any insects in the room? Not on the initially, um, but when I actually got around to look at the baby, there were small black flies flying around in like the, there was a quilt over Sterling's lap, and there was these small black flies that were flying around in front of his face. All right, so you spoke with Tony, and you spoke with Jeremy McGrath. Uh, based on what they told you, what did you do? Well, I looked, I looked at what they were seeing. Um, they pointed out um, some things about the baby that would, were obviously inconsistent with, with life or resuscitation efforts. Um, I was struck by how spindly, how small the arm and the neck and the, the exposed um, feet were, just tiny. And uh, the child had, I don't know if it... I mean, several people referred to it as blood, but I, I, it was like a dark substance on his mouth, and, and it, it was down onto his shirt. And where that um, dark stuff was, it, you could tell that it like hardened. It was like stiff. The shirt was like stiff. So I mean, it was. It looked like it had been there some time. Um, Did you, at that point, uh, based on what you had been told by medical personnel and based on your own observations? At that point, did you consider that room, did you consider Sterling to be a crime scene? Yeah. So how did you protect your crime scene? Uh, actually, Jeremy, I had him step out and ask uh, Tony not to touch anything or do anything further um, and just to stand there. I, I wanted someone to be present so that that, that condition in that room and that situation wouldn't change until I got another officer there. You left Tony with the baby. Yes. What did you do? What did you do? I went and asked the parents what had happened. Um, did you speak with Cheyenne Harris? I did. Did you speak with her when you when you were in the apartment? Yes. 
Did she have an explanation as to what had happened? Well, she said that, um, uh, first I got their identification information and, and that she was holding Nala. They have another child. Um, and just got basic information. We talked a little bit about you know, them as a family and, and how the, what the living arrangements were. And she explained that Zach had, had worked the previous night and had woken up, or she had woken up and discovered um, Sterling had died and then woke up Zach. And that's what she told you there in the apartment? Yes. You said that uh, the defendant, Cheyenne Harris, was holding Nala. Did you make observations of Nala? She looked to be a normal height, weight, size, active, alert, attentive toddler. There was nothing about her appearance or condition that concerned you? No, no. So you were taking basic information from the defendant and, and Zach Cohen. Was there a point in time that you decided to talk to each alone? Yes, often, especially in a family dynamic like that where I don't know, I've never met any of these people before. Um, my normal practice would probably be to talk to the, the woman, her mom or wife first separately, um, just to try and gather some information about a set of circumstances. Um, so I asked if we could step out and, and talk separately, and then um, Zach took care of Nala when we stepped out of that room. Um, I went to the went into the living room area there. I was going to sit at a kitchen table or a couch or whatever. They really didn't have a, a good place to sit, so I had her have a seat. Um, they had a recliner <coughs> chair there in the in the kind of in the kitchen area actually. Um, we tried to have a conversation there. I started trying to talk to her, but at that point, some additional law enforcement and other people were arriving on scene, um, and we kept getting interrupted. People were, were walking through there. So so what did you do? I asked her if we could step out to my truck, and I, my truck is an unmarked Dodge pickup, and so we walked out to my truck, and we talked on the way out to the truck about some of the history and how long they'd lived there. She said that they'd been there for about... Well, three months or so since since Jerome was born, they they moved there together from Riceville. Were you dressed as you are today on August thirtieth, two thousand seventeen? Yes. Okay, so you had your uniform on, and yeah. everyone was aware you were a deputy, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So you took a Cheyenne Harris out to your truck. Um, what did you do when you were in the truck with her? I just asked her what happened. Um, and when, when she had checked on Sterling last and how that process had gone, um, initially she told me that she, he had woke, she woke up and fed him the night before, um, which was, in, and that was the last time that he would, she'd have seen him, and that was inconsistent with the initial information I had was that um, they had checked on him at 9 a.m. and that at 11:30, they discovered him deceased, and I, and I and I may have misunderstood in the dispatch, but I, I think everybody basically understood it was, you know, that couple of hours. But in talking with Cheyenne, um, that time kept expanding, and she admitted that she wasn't sure when she had fed him or, or cared for him last, and and that it would have still been light out the night before. Um, it was around the time, or after Zach had gone to work, but before it had gotten dark out, that she'd actually seen him or, or fed him. And she said that she'd, uh, she'd fed him formula. She, she said that last night he had taken four ounces, and then, she'd take, then he would take another four ounces. All right, let's back up a little bit in regards to your conversation with the defendant. In speaking with her, did you find out just some basic information about her family? Yes. Okay. What did she tell you about her relationship with Zach Cohen? She said they'd been they'd been they'd met three or four years previous to that. Um, they had Nala um, and lived in Riceville. She was living with her mom when Sterling was born, um, and then they'd moved in together to the house or the apartment in Alta Vista. When I asked about where she was from, she explained that, you know, she'd been living in Riceville, but she'd grown up in Charles City. 
um, and that Zach, she seemed uncertain as to where he was actually from, but that he'd lived in, in California and, and had spent quite a bit of time in Iowa, and that his parents had moved to Oklahoma, and that Zach had an older son that his parents were caring for in Oklahoma. So the defendant was telling you that Nala and Sterling were their children together? Yes, that they were both biological parents of Nala and Sterling. And how old was Nala at the time? 20 months. She was born in November 2015. What was her demeanor like when you were talking to her? She was crying. She appeared upset. But when, when I spoke with her, it wasn't not saying she was inconsolable, but she was able to answer questions appropriately and or at least answer questions um, as we were talking. Did she appear to be under the influence of anything? Not that I could see. So she could, in your opinion, was she comprehending what you were asking and responding appropriately? Yes. From a more clinical standpoint, her pupils appeared to be of normal size, her speech wasn't slurred, her walk and gait seemed appropriate, her conversational pace seemed appropriate for someone not under the influence of like a stimulant or, or some other drug. And as a law enforcement officer, do you have a background in training um, for purposes of identifying people who are under the influence? I'm actually a certified drug recognition expert instructor, uh, meaning I've taught officers how to become drug recognition experts, and I do um, advanced roadside interdiction training for officers as well. Did she tell you, did the defendant tell you how long that they had been living in Alta Vista? I, I gathered that it was after Sterling was born, then they had moved there. I think it was three months that they had been living there. So they hadn't, hadn't been there long? No. Uh, she told you Sterling was born on May 1st, 2017? Yes. Right, let's go to when she was talking about the last time she saw Sterling alive. She told you that she fed him the night before? Yes. And how much did she feed him? She said that they would routinely feed him four ounces and then they'd feed him an additional four ounces. That would get him through the night. And what time did she tell you she did that the night before? The, after a number of different wranglings, I don't know that she was ever very specific but the best I could get from her was that it was still light out and it was after Zach had left for work, which would have been around 4.30. I did check um, and sunset on that day would have been at 7.49 p.m. So it would have been then sometime prior to 7.49 p.m. I think this is a good time to take our mid-afternoon recess. We will break for approximately 15 minutes, resume with the direct examination of Deputy Palo. Ladies and gentlemen, please continue to heed my admonition. Do not discuss the case among yourselves or with anybody else. Please do not do any independent research or watch any news accounts, either on TV or on the Internet. Thank you. I believe I told you yesterday, I just want to reemphasize that when you enter the courtroom, the cameras are pointed to the ceiling, so you are never videotaped. And when you leave the courtroom, the same way, they're remotely controlled back there. They immediately go to the ceiling, so you're never on camera, okay? Rest assured. All right, Ms. Timmons, continue. When we left off, you were in the car, in your car, talking with the defendant. On this particular day, when you're meeting with her, is it fair to say that you knew something wasn't right, but you didn't know at that time what actually had happened? Well, just to clarify, any unattended death is a potential crime scene. You know, we investigate all deaths um, until we rule out issues. This case, just the condition of the baby and, and the conflicting information we'd already gotten, you, you, we're, we're trying to sort it out. We don't know that a crime's occurred or anything like that, but, but there are a lot of questions, and it seemed like we were getting more and more questions as the time went on. So, I, yeah, I didn't know that there was a, any kind of criminal act or anything like that, but 
but certainly we were investigating an unattended death, which we always do. So, so at, the time that, at the time that you were speaking with her, were you at that point just trying to get some basic information? Yes. You know, the questions I had asked her were, you know, what was Sterling's health like? What, what medications was he taking and things like that? I was just trying to determine, you know, how we got to where we were. When you were speaking with Cheyenne, did she tell you anything about what the routine at home was? Uh, did she work? No, Cheyenne didn't work out of the house, and she explained that Zach had been working some extra hours. Um, Zach drives truck, um, actually delivers chickens, um, and she explained how he was you know, worked the night shift and had worked some extra shifts in the preceding weeks. Right, and you talked about that she said the last time she saw him was the night before, sometime before it got dark, correct? Yes. Um, did she explain what she did for the rest of that night and that morning and that following morning? Yeah, she, well, she's talking about caring for Nala and feeding Nala and um, trying to keep Nala up a little bit later so she would have been on a normal sleeping pattern. Um, she said she was doing dishes number of household type chores and, and just around the apartment. Did she discuss what time Zach had gotten home? I don't remember if the exact time was given. I mean, through investigation, we kind of determined when he, when he arrived home. And that was approximately when? 4, 4.30. In the morning? Yes. That would have been on the 30th. Did Cheyenne say that she was up when Zach got home? They got up and ate together, um, Nala and Cheyenne and, and Zach. So when Zach came home, they all sat down together to eat? It sounds like that was what occurred. Is that what she had told you during yes. that conversation? Yep. Did she tell you what they ate? I believe it was grilled cheese sandwiches, if I'm not mistaken. All right, so they, uh, as a family, the three of them, were eating grilled cheese sandwiches, and then what? They went to bed. And during that time frame, she had not checked on Sterling? Correct. Did she explain to you how she found Sterling uh, in the condition that he was? She said that you know, she'd woken up with Nala, and that she thought to herself that she hadn't checked on him in a bit. And... Did she say what time she had woken up? Uh, again, I don't remember the exact time given, but it, it sounded like around 11, 11.30. Late morning. Late morning, yes. Proceed. So she had gone in and checked on him and determined that he had died and went back and woke Zach up. And what did she tell Zach, did she say? That he, would, he had passed, that he had died. Now, you saw that Sterling was found dead in a, in a baby swing. Correct. Did you ask her about that swing? Well, I asked, did she pick him up? How did she, you know, I, I, I was, was a little bit confused. As, I mean, if it was, you would think that in, in determining whether your child had passed away, you would get a close look or... or at least uncover or take the baby out of the swing, and that, 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 that she said she did not pick him up. Um, so when she found Sterling dead in the morning, she said that she didn't touch him or move him? Correct. Did she talk at all about whether that was a normal place for Sterling to sleep? She, she said that her mother had a swing like that and that they had used that uh, previously um, and that it soothed him because it rocked. Um, it was a powered swing. Um, and when we found it, it was actually, the light was on. The swing wasn't swinging, but it was plugged in and the, and the light was actually on. Um, and that's where apparently Sterling, she said that Sterling slept in that, and then Nala slept in a crib next to the bed that she shared with Zach in the other bedroom. We've seen pictures of the apartment, and there was a, a baby or a toddler playpen in what's been called the master bedroom. Is that the... The place where she described Nala sleeping? Yes, that's where she described Nala as, as sleeping. All right, and during this conversation, you asked her about normal feedings for Sterling? Yes. 
And, and when she told you that he ate four ounces every feeding, did it seem anything out of the ordinary? Did it seem like, you know, Sterling was fed all the time? Well, having told me that she fed him a total of eight ounces of formula the night, the night before, um, and just given my observations of the child, I, there was something, at least, I'm not a doctor or anything like that, but it seemed somewhat inconsistent with what I was seeing. But Cheyenne's statements to you were that she fed Sterling. Yes. Did you ask her if she ever took Sterling to the doctor for baby checkups? I did. Actually, in, in asking about Sterling's health, you know, I asked if he was on any medications, had he gone full term. Actually, in the apartment still, um, I'd asked those, a couple of those questions, and she said that Sterling had shown up early unexpectedly and was born in a bathtub at home. Um, he was born at 39 weeks. She said he showed up a week early, so I would assume that that would have meant that he was born in about 39 weeks. Um, she said her pregnancy was confusing for her in that she thought, um, because she has some irregular um, bathroom habits, uh, that she just had to go to the bathroom. And uh, she said she pushed and his head popped out unexpectedly. She didn't really recognize the labor as labor. She thought it was that she just needed to use the bathroom. So. Um, she said they went to the Cresco Hospital um, after Sterling was born. They were both hospitalized. They had actually been transferred to Mason City, and they were both hospitalized for a period of time because she hemorrhaged and because he had some breathing issues. How Do you know uh, how long they stayed in the hospital? Did she tell you that? It sounded like about a week. And upon understand. release, did you ask her if there was any health problems with Sterling? She said that he had had a rash, but that it had gotten better. Um, I asked about, well, baby visits or subsequent follow-up visits, you know, after the hospitalization. Um, she said that they had appointments, but that uh, she did not get to the appointments. She hadn't had Sterling back to the doctor at all since he came home from the hospital. Did she tell you that he had been healthy since he came home, though? Yes, with the exception of that rash. And did she describe where that rash was? I didn't. I didn't get into the details of that, I don't believe. Did you have any discussions with the defendant about whether she was on, any, on whether the defendant was on any medications? I also asked Cheyenne if, if she was on any medications. Actually, right at the very end of our, we were walking back into the apartment after talking, I um, just asked if she had been on any medications for anything, you know, health-wise. What did she say? She said she hadn't um, since just after Nala was born. She had been diagnosed with postpartum depression, and they had started her on something, but she never took it because it made her sick when she did. And Nala was two, almost two years old at the time. Huh? Well, she was 20 months. <coughs> right after you spoke with the defendant, did you go back into the apartment? Actually, I went back and I met then briefly with, uh, with Zach. Did you speak with Zach as well? I did, shortly. Um, that conversation was cut short. I had, I had asked to get hold of the DCI, and I received a call back. Um, as I started to talk to Zach, I received a call back from John Turbot from the DCI. Okay, tell us what DCI is. I'm sorry. The, the Division of Criminal Investigation is a, a branch of the state. Um, basically, it's an investigative service that's offered by the um, Department of Public Safety and they provide investigators to assist agencies like mine that don't have a ton of resources and a bunch of investigators. Um, so the DCI is, a, is an organization within the state of Iowa that we call on. Unfortunately for me, I've had the opportunity to call the DCI in several times where we've had homicides or really serious cases where there was just too much of a case for us to be able to pursue just from an hours and resources and training perspective. They, they're fantastic investigators and, and very good at what they do. At what point did you decide to call the DCI? Well, when I, when I initially arrived on scene and we were talking, conferring, I, I spoke briefly with Jason Russell. Um, just things weren't adding up, and uh, I'd asked him to go ahead and got, contact the DCI. And then, again, John called me back. John Turbot from the DCI called me back. And he called you right when, or close in time to when you started your conversation with Zach Cohen, correct? Correct. So you spoke with John Turbot on the phone? It actually gave me, I've 
I've worked with John for many years on, on different cases, and it actually gave me a chance to take a step back, you know, because at that point I was just still trying to gather some information. I didn't really look at it as a criminal thing necessarily, but um, there seemed to be a lot of parts and pieces to it. So in talking with him, um, it kind of gave me a pause to think through where we were at with him, the beginnings of this investigation. And, and uh, John and I uh, basically came to the conclusion that, hey, let's, let's hold up and, uh, and just see if, if Zach and Cheyenne would come to the sheriff's office where we could sit down and talk away from the scene and, and you know, try and get a, a much clearer picture, slow things down a little bit and have a, have a more involved conversation about what happened. Did you ask the defendant and Zach Cohen to come to the sheriff's office? I did. I asked if, if, if he and Cheyenne would be able to come to the sheriff's office. Um, Zach's concern was he didn't have enough gas um, in the car to make it down there, so I, I gave him $10 to be able to put some gas in their car to come down. Uh, did the, were any arrangements made for Nala before the defendant and Zach left the apartment building? I mentioned before when I arrived on scene, the gal that directed me to the apartment, she knew the Cohen Harris family and had actually babysat for Zach and, and Sterling previously. So um, they said that she'd be able to watch Nala. Um, I, um, Zach and Shane, I'm not sure which one asked me, but they asked that I go grab some diapers out of their bedroom and um, a phone charger. Zach's phone was about dead. So I went back in the apartment and I grabbed a, some diapers for Nala and a phone charger and then we dropped Nala off at the neighbor's house. So before they left, they wanted to make sure Nala had some diapers before she went to the neighbors. Yep. Right, about what time did they leave the apartment complex? It was probably before two. I mean, my my whole conversation with Cheyenne was around twenty minutes in the truck. So I mean, I would, I would guess by two they had left. And what did you do after they left? Um, we had given some statement forms to a couple of the first responders. I collected those statement forms, met briefly with, uh, with the sheriff, and then uh, our medical examiner had arrived on scene, and I, I talked briefly with him. Um, Did you at some point make a phone call to the Department of Human Services? Yeah, whenever there's a, a death of an infant or unexplained or unattended death of an infant, um, we, would, we would make a report to the Department of Human Services. In this case, um, you know, I had some concerns too. I, there, were, there were a lot of unanswered questions and we had this other toddler, infant, little person to be concerned with too. So I, I just kind of gave them a heads up. You know, I had some concerns about what was going on in this household and I and, uh, wasn't sure exactly where that was going to go. All right, so you notified DHS. Uh, then what did you do? Just to clarify, DHS, the Department of Human Services, in case you haven't, if you're not familiar with that organization, we, by law, we've got to report certain stuff. And, and the death of an infant would be certainly one of those things. And if you have a concern, um, they're kind of our resource as far as if you were looking at outside placements. Um, I, just to clarify that in case you didn't know. Um, sorry. So after you contacted DHS, what did you do? I, I drove back to the office, took those statement forms, talked to the sheriff briefly, made sure we had security set up on the apartment. You know, when we start an investigation like this, one of the things we do is we just kind of seal that off so that there's not people coming and going and things aren't changing in that environment. Um, if you want to have an investigation, you have to have, you know, you have to maintain what's going on there to be able to, to make sense of it later. So that's that was how we assigned things. I drove back to the office and um, I had spoke with John Turbot and uh, Special Agent uh, Chris, Chris Calloway uh, it was coming up with him as well. And then uh, I met them at the, at the Sheriff's Office. When you arrived back at the Sheriff's Office, was Zach and the defendant already there? No, they hadn't arrived yet. When they did arrive, what did, what did you do with them? Actually, we met, we met outside on the sidewalk in front of the sheriff's office. And I introduced, uh, well, we had, because it took them quite a while to get there, um, I introduced John and Chris to, to Zach and Cheyenne. It took who quite a while? Zach and Cheyenne. How long did it take them to get to the sheriff's office? 
I'm not entirely certain exactly when they arrived, but I, like I said, I had spent some time at the scene collecting those statements and talking to some people, and then I had driven back to the sheriff's office, and they had already left before that, and I drove back to the sheriff's office, met with John and Chris, talked about who would probably interview who and how we'd facilitate that, and we were just starting to think they weren't coming. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they're... I'd asked them to come, I'd given them money for gas, but that's no that's no guarantee that they'd actually um, come down there. So. And are you aware of what they were doing during that time? N no. All right, so when they did show up at the sheriff's office, what happened? Um, we had talked in advance before they arrived about John possibly interviewing Zach and uh, Chris interviewing Cheyenne. And so introduced John and Zach and they went up to our, we have an interview room in our, in the sheriff's office. It's upstairs, it's not in the locked part of the building at all. Um, and that interview took place upstairs. Um, the defendant was interviewed by Chris Calloway, and we don't, we only have one. We're a small, we're a small agency. There's only, at the time there was only nine of us, including the sheriff. So, um, we didn't have another interview room, so Chris actually sat with her in his car out in the street in front of the sheriff's office and, and spoke with her there. And what were you assigned to do? Well, shortly after that, um, Special Agent Jim Teal arrived. Um, and uh, we talked about the case and what was going on while those interviews were occurring. And um, decisions were made to make applications for search warrants for the residents, um, th both Zach and Cheyenne's person and the car that they were driving, just to gather information. Were the search warrants just for their person and car, or did you also obtain one for their home as well? We obtained, we obtained search warrants for Zach and Cheyenne, the apartment, and the vehicle that they were driving. There were subsequent search warrants additionally for the phones and, and other things. Once those warrants were put together, were they approved by a judge? Yes, they were. After the warrants were approved, what did you do? Well, the interviews were still going on, um, and I wanted to stay there till that was all concluded, um, because we had, again, we had the search warrants for their persons. We took their clothing and, and phones that they had with them. Um, um, Agent Thiel actually went back to the residence, and they started to, to search the residence on that. I was also waiting for the interviews to be done, and we had the warrant, so I went ahead and hand-searched their car that was there in the, in the parking lot. What kind of car did they have? It was, a, it was Cheyenne, registered to Cheyenne. Um, it was a purple-ish Buick Century. Did you find anything in the car? Uh, it was a purple-ish Buick Century four-door. Um, it had a, a toddler, large car seat in the back, and it had kind of armrests, and it was forward-facing. Kind of what you'd expect Nala or even a bigger kid to be in. It wouldn't be a car seat that an infant could be in. No, absolutely not. What else did you find in the car? Um, there were two tires behind the driver's seat, on the back, in the back seat, behind the driver's seat, like wedged between the door and the, the seat, and then one of them was actually resting kind of on the armrest of the, of the child safety seat. Um, a bunch of trash, like adult traveling trash, you know, soda bottles, chip bags, Pringles bags, or not Pringles, but there was chips bags and Gatorade and other empty pop bottles. There's a doll in there. Um, like a toy doll? Yeah. Like, but was there any room in that car to put an infant seat? Not as it was. Did you find any infant type items in the car? No. Who did you speak with after searching the car? Well, we spoke, I spoke again with uh, John Turbot and uh, Chris Calloway and also had um, a matron come in to assist us in getting um, Cheyenne changed. I'd, uh, I sent one of my staff up to pick up clothing for Zach and Cheyenne so they'd have something to wear. Um, and then I had one of our matron staff, one of our jail, female jail staff, um, assist in getting Cheyenne changed so we could see the clothing that they were wearing. Did you also speak with DHS, Department of Human Services, I did. again? I did at that, at that point, and after the subsequent interviews, we made the decision to do an emergency law enforcement removal of Nala. We really hadn't figured out what was going on there, and we have deep concerns for her safety, so 
I advised the Department of Human Services that I was going to do an emergency removal and asked that they get foster temporary care lined up for the other child. And did Nala go to temporary foster care? Yeah, when I went back to the apartment in Alta Vista, um, I was met there by that worker that was picking Nala up at that time. Did you assist her then in removing Nala? Yes. Do you know about what time that was? And after 8, it had gotten to be a longish day, but probably around 8 o'clock. All right. So you're back at the apartments at this point, correct? Correct. What did you do when you arrived back there and after helping remove Nala? Well, and one of the things we do when we have an unintended death or any kind of suspicious death is we want to figure out who last interacted with the victim, you know, and when was that. So I knew that um, Jennifer Shriver had provided child care for both Zach, or both uh, Sterling and Nala previously. So I, I interviewed her. I wanted to know what she knew about that and took her written statement. Did you also assist with the search of the apartment? Not really. My, again, Jim Thiel was, was kind of taking care of that, as was um, Deputy Russell. Um, my real purpose there was to try and figure out how best to get um, Sterling's body to the medical examiner's office for autopsy. We had already called and gotten an appointment for 8 a.m. the next morning for autopsy to be done. Um, so we most most of my job there became trying to figure out how best to give them the clearest picture of what we were looking at. Now, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, what do you mean about what's the best way to, to get his body out? You, generally speaking, in an adult unintended death, you can't send the whole bed. <laughs> you know, or you can't send, or you could, but they don't have that much space. But in this case, we wanted to give the medical examiner's office the best chance at being able to observe the evidence in the way that we saw it. So what we elected to do was um, we actually took the powered swing apart and we left Sterling's body covered and as it was in that swing assembly and we placed the entire assembly into the body bag and positioned it and then I carried it from, from there out into the transporter's van. We sealed it um, with an evidentiary tag and positioned it in there. I talked to the transporter about how important it was to keep the keep the package oriented the way it was. And then I also took the apparatus that the swing attached to. I seized that as part of the search warrant, put that in my truck, and I brought that with me to the to the autopsy the next morning. Did you observe the body bag being sealed? I did. And when you put Sterling in the body bag, still in the car seat, you it's, left him in the condition as you found him, correct? Yes, exactly. We didn't even remove clothing or anything like that. We, I mean, he was obviously deceased. There's no, oftentimes for a medical examiner investigator, they, they do more of an assessment, but in this case, it was so obviously that he'd been deceased for some time. It wasn't, we felt it was more important to get him down as in the best state possible for evidence. And it's a swing, it's not a car seat, it's a powered swing. Who transported Sterling then? Um, the transporter was a, a funeral director from New Hampton. And then you took the rest of the swing in your car? I did. When did you go to Ankeny at the medical examiner's office? I left that residence a little after 10, 10.30. Um, and then I was in Ankeny at 8 a.m. the next morning. Before I was actually there about 7.30. All right, let's talk about the autopsy a little bit. Uh, this is August 31st, 2017, correct? Yes. Uh, is that standard for law enforcement to be present at an autopsy in a, in a suspicious death? We do that on a regular basis if, you know, a foul play is suspected, and, and it's oftentimes it's helpful with the medical examiner if we can provide them with that ongoing information stream to help them do their job. This is not the first infant death that I'd actually gone to the autopsy of. So you arrive at the, the medical examiner's office in Ankeny. What happens then? Well, we came in and we briefed with um, his staff. Uh, Dr. Klein is the, was the medical examiner. Um, 
Sterling's body had been placed on an examination table in the bag as we had positioned it. Um, and as the bag was opened, I could see that it, he, nothing had moved. It looked exactly as it did when we put him in the bag. What happened next? We staffed, I don't know what you would call it, but basically they asked me a ton of questions about what I had learned about the death and, and the timelines that, that we were able to come up with. Um, and they kept coming back to questions about how long had the child been deceased. Um, when I arrived at the lab, it, there wasn't a ton of odor because he was still in the bag, but as soon as the bag was open, that, that odor was there again. Was a decision made to set up the swing before the autopsy started? After I explained why we brought down the powered swing and that I had the apparatus with me, they were excited that I could bring that in and set it up for them. So we did that. We just What we had done was we had taken a bolt out that kind of held the, held the top of the swing to the apparatus. And so it was pretty easy to put it back together and just slide that bolt in. So they could see the angles and the attitude of the chair and everything as it was. After the medical examiner being able to observe Sterling in the swing uh, as he was, then what happened? So then the actual autopsy part started and they systematically went down through the swing and removed the articles that were there um, with Sterling and evaluated each piece as, as we went. Um, now what are you do, doing during this process? Are you just observing or are you participating? I'm observing um, and asking questions probably more than <laughs> More than they would have liked, but I, I had a lot of questions. Uh, how many layers were on Sterling? I'm not sure. Well, tell us what you saw when they when they started taking the, the blankets and clothes. So there was a, yeah. you know, Sterling was wearing a like his shirt was like a onesie that I described with the staining on the front of it, um, and then that was tucked into some shorts, a little. I mean, they didn't come all the way down his legs or like shorts, kind of, like Bermudas or whatever. Um, and so first they took off that, there was a quilt laid over the top of him. Um, have they seen any pictures yet? Okay. There was a quilt laid over the top of him, and then once we took that off, that was completely saturated, and it was like stained with this brown, what looked to most likely be a combination of urine and feces. Then there was a sleeveless hooded sweatshirt that was kind of wrapped in there and then a, a shirt and then um, several pairs of socks and then some of those little finger thingies like to keep a baby from scratching himself. They, I, I'm not even sure how many actual articles of clothing but we laid all of it out on the table and we dug down to where it was just just him in this one. So all of these layers were sitting on top of him? On top and then tucked in and around him kind of were they all soaked? Yeah, everything was everything was that putrid, gray brown slurry of. It was really the the odor as we took the quilt off and dug down through that was. Um, I think in my report I called it acrid or acidic or I don't know. I, it was. It wasn't like normal decomposition. Like I've been around a lot of dead bodies and you know, thirty-ish years I've been doing this. It wasn't like that. It was a different kind of a the combination of urine and feces and and like uh, I don't know. It was just it was really strong. I can't I can't convey in words how bad that 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 was. When these layers were taken off of Sterling and clothing was start started to be taken off of him, was anything out of the ordinary notice? Well, in one of the I think one of the reasons that there were a lot of questions to ask is that um, I'm a fisherman and one of the things I use I fish for panfish and I use waxworms and observed what it looked to be like tiny little waxworms or larva maggots um, in the clothing around Sterling and as we took the clothing off on Sterling's skin and in that slurry there were um, these bugs. The little black bugs weren't flying around so much, and I'm not sure if that was from having been in the bag. I mean, there wasn't much flying around, but you had the larvae and stuff, um, both in the clothing and on Sterling, in different colors. There's like really light colored ones, and there were some darker colored ones that were further away in the, in the clothing. They saw maggots. Yes. 
Did Sterling have a diaper on? Yes. What did that look like? So, in the process of going through this, we, it was pretty systematic. They kind of went down through and what was in the seat. And the seat was completely saturated. And then the, the combination of urine and feces had like been strained out through the diaper. So then um, when they took the diaper off, the uh, skin underneath the diaper was extremely compressed. And a lot of the skin was like loose and sloughing off where it was mixed with the feces and the, and the stuff. So it, it was hard to tell the margins of where the skin stopped and the diaper started and the, and the sludge into the clothing. It was all just kind of a, um, just a, it was a mess. It looked like that diaper had not been changed in a, in a very long time. Once all of this clothing was removed, what did you notice about Sterling's body? I, I was shocked. I mean, I, I mentioned before when I saw him in the apartment how tiny, like his arms and his legs and his feet and his neck looked. But when the clothing came off, everything under the clothing was far worse. You could see every rib. He had no butt to speak of. It was, you know, pretty much flat. And where the pants and the diaper were, it, it compressed down to. I mean, it just didn't look like there was any weight or any anything left to him. Now, I'm not a doctor and I can't really assess that stuff, but, um, but that was but your observation. It was so, a, so small. You know, he's four months old and it's just tiny. After autopsy, did you continue to do any follow-up work? Yeah, I actually stayed through the entire autopsy, the, the rest of it. Um, and I asked a lot of questions, and, and we did collect. Um, I actually I participated with Dr. Klein in collecting some of those bugs as specimens. Um, we continued the investigation, um, talked to everyone in the apartment complex, talked to everyone in every house around the apartment complex, um, spoke with um, Zach's employer and, and others that were friends with both Zach and Cheyenne. Uh, we continue to invest in, investigate elements of this case through this whole process. Did you do anything with the defendant's phone? Yes. Um, we seized, there was actually three phones that were seized, the defendant, Zach's, and then another phone from the residence, and then some other devices as well. I want to talk specifically about the defendant's phone. Uh, what did you do with it? We used a process, um, we work with uh, the Waterloo Police Department has a specialized equipment to be able to extract data from cell phones and other devices um, and we brought the phone down to have an extraction done basically where they hook it up to us it's called a Celebrite machine um, you may have heard of that in the news but it's a machine that can take the information off the phone and, and give it to us in a format that we can review without actually changing the evidence Generally, well, and it, at some point, then that all gets put into a report for you, correct? Correct. And you've looked at that? I have. Throughout the month of August of 2017, uh, did the defendant have communications with her mother, Brandy Harris? Yes. Um, and how, how were you seeing those communications? A combination of text messages and then in texting, sometimes you can send pictures and, and such like that. Uh, were you able to look at text conversations between the defendant and Zach Kane or Zach Cohen during yes. the month of August? Yes. Um, what was the feel of those text messages and, and the feel of their relationship at that time? It seemed like they had something of a running dialogue most of the time when Zach was at work. Um, oftentimes, Cheyenne would be complaining about him not being home um, or not coming home to his family, but kind of normal stuff. Um, and there were uh, many text messages where you see the defendant telling Zach she loved him and things like that? Yes. Did you also see on the defendant's phone that um, she played games on her phone? Yes. During the month of August? Yes. Even the night of the 30th, it would appear. The night of the 30th, she was playing games on her phone? 
Well, the 29th into the 30th, yeah. Excuse me, the 29th. Yes. Um, what kind of games was she playing? I, I don't remember the actual names. I'd have to look at the report, but I'd like the jeweled or bubble pop thing. I, I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't recall the actual. They're, Candy Crush, things like that? This, I don't think Candy Crush was one, but yes, games like that. All right, so all, for all purposes, your, your review of her phone, you really didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Is that fair to say? No, I, I really didn't see anything either way. I mean, it was, I think the last search histories that she had was for a, a restaurant in Wisconsin called Hanson's Hold Up and her web search histories. and. Um, did you also have to look into uh, a town celebration called Wapsie Days? Yes. Uh, first of all, what is Wapsie Days? Well, every little town in Iowa has a days of some sort, um, whether it's corn days or cow days or whatever. Well, Wapsie Days is rice mills on the Wapsie River, Wapsie Pinnacle River, and, and uh, it was that year was the fourth, fifth, and sixth of August was their city celebration. So August fourth. 5th and 6th of 2017 was Wapsie Days? Yes. And that's held in Riceville? Correct. Why, why were you looking into when that was? Well, as I mentioned before, we're always trying to figure out who saw the victim last and who, you know, we try and piece together everything we can um, about, you know, how do we get to where we are. So we're, we're always looking for who cared for the child and, and things like that. And, and the best we could figure out was that uh, Brandy Harris, which is um, Cheyenne's mom, would have cared for Sterling and Nala over the course of Wapsie days. We really didn't identify anybody else that had contact with Sterling after that. That's fair to say that the defendant's mother, through your investigation, is the last person that can say they saw Sterling healthy. Correct. And that would have been the weekend of August 4th, 5th, 6th, correct, of 2017. Sharon, can we take a quick break before I go into my next set of questions? Yes. It should be just a couple of minutes that we need to talk to you. Do we need to remove the jury or do you want to just talk in sidebar? I think we can just go back and see. What we'll need the defendant present, though. Yes. Okay. Merrily, you will need to stay here with the jury while we're back there, okay? All right. Feel free to stand, stretch. This shouldn't take us too long. This courtroom is designed somewhat strange and that they actually have to leave and have to go back here. So this will just take us a few minutes. Barb, we will need you. Will. All right. Proceed. Sterling was found dead on August 30th, 2017. You continued your investigation, correct? Correct. Um, was there a point in time when the defendant was arrested for the death of Sterling? Yes, October 25th. Why did it take so long? Well, there was a lot of people to talk to and a lot of investigation to do. Um, but what it ended up coming down to was we had to wait for the medical examiners final autopsy report, they would not, at the time of the autopsy, you know, and I mentioned that I might have been a bit annoying to the medical examiner, I, I kept asking, what caused this baby's death, what, you know, and they won't answer that at that time. There was chromosomal studies and all kinds of tissue samples and toxicology and, and all those things have to go out and be analyzed. and. And then, you know, the reports have to be written, and it takes, it takes months for that information to come back. It's not like on TV. Once you received the autopsy report, though, the decision was made? Absolutely. To arrest Cheyenne Harris, correct? Yes. Okay. Who else was arrested that day? Uh, Zach Cohen. And he was arrested also for murder in first degree and child endangerment, resulting yes. in death? Yes, he was. Since that time, have you remained on the case and assisting where needed? Yes, I have. And I'd like to go back to discussing all of this stuff. We've heard that, that there's maybe three, four hundred people that live there, is that right? 
probably closer to three ish. Small town. <laughs> yeah, small, pretty small community. You've seen States Exhibit 37, which is a map of part of Alta Vista. I have. And the map includes uh, the apartment complex that we've been discussing, correct? Yes, it does. At this time, I would ask to enter States Exhibit 37. Any objection? You said 37? Permission to publish. 37 is admitted and granted. Is there a pointer? There is. It's a little green. The green button. The green. Oh, okay. So this is the east edge of the city of Alta Vista. And that would be the right side of the photograph. Correct. And this is the main east-west street in Alta Vista. It's Weber Street. And that's the top of the photograph. This this street here. And then this would be the apartment complex. And that's depicted on the photograph with a blue line around the complex, correct? Correct. Which apartment building was Sterling in? Sterling is in this building. And again, there were four apartments in each of these buildings. There's a hallway that runs down the middle of each building and then two apartments, one in the front and one in the back. This is the south apartment. Apartment number seven would have been this, this apartment unit right here. So you were pointing at the center apartment out of the three, it was the middle, correct? Correct. Okay. And then the particular apartment, number seven, is in the top right-hand corner this. of that building. Correct. Is there a gas station in Alta Vista? Yes, it's called the AV Express. What kind of things do they have in there? It's a convenience store. They've got pop, candy, Cigarettes, I think they have beer, uh, diapers, peanut butter. Most importantly, they have coffee. But they do have diapers there? Yes. How far away is that gas station from that apartment complex? It's approximately a block off screen here. If you follow this grade up towards Weber, Here, it's going to be just west of that on the north side of the road. So you're pointing to the top of the photograph and off to the left. It would be about here, I'm guessing. So roughly. it's a two-three block walk. And from what I understand, it's where Cheyenne met Jennifer Shriver. She was working there. Uh, Shriver was working there at the time. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, officer. Good afternoon. When <clears throat> Ms. Harris and Zach came down to uh, the station for the interview, who was driving? I'm not sure. Uh, do you know who, how those uh, tires got in the back seat of that car? I know that they had had some tire problems and that um, Jordan Clark had assisted them with some tire repairs. Okay. But no, I don't know how the tires came to be in the back of the car. Or, or really when, correct? Correct. You spoke for roughly 20 minutes with Ms. Harris? In my truck, we were, out, truck? Yeah, we were out there for about 20 minutes. I know that, let's say that we can divide this into two parts. You sort of had your initial discussion with her at the apartment. 
but in order to have a more in-depth conversation with her, you needed to take her out to the truck so that you would be uninterrupted. Fair enough? Yeah, we, we, if you watch my attempts at trying to talk to her with people walking in and out, it was just, it wasn't, it just wasn't working. It's something we could watch because you had a body cam on, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And was that body cam on when you were talking to her in the, in your truck? It was. And so there would be a full recording of that 20 minutes? Correct. Okay. And that recording of that 20 minutes with Ms. Harris uh, would show that she was crying? Yes. And that she was upset? Yes. Um, she was able to answer your questions, but throughout that interview she was crying and upset. Fair? Yes. And is it also fair to say that she was soft-spoken? I had no problem hearing her. Okay. I, I, I guess I, I really hadn't... I felt that her response volume was appropriate. I think on the video, it may be because of the distance from my camera. I think her, I, I, she may be softer spoken, but I don't think that was an issue for me at all. Okay. Um, obviously, the best evidence of that would be the recording, right? Well, again, my body camera and her on the other side of the truck. I mean, it, yeah, obviously, my voice is going to be louder because I'm, yeah. I'm very close to that camera, and her voice is going to be quieter. Um, and, I, and I find that in all of my recordings just about. So. Um, Zach said he needed $10 for gas, is that right? Well, I don't know that he said a dollar amount, but he, they, he said he didn't have enough gas to get to town. That's fair. You gave him the 10 bucks. He said he, he was worried about getting to town. So presumably on the way down to the station, they would have stopped for gas, right? I actually learned later that they did go to the AV Express to, to put in some gas. And I, now, and Ms. Harris explained to you that she had um, at least been prescribed some medication before for depression, is that right? She referenced postpartum depression after Nala was born. Uh, was any, any work to, on your part in the investigation of that done to verify that with the hospital or I, doctor? I know that we had looked for medical records. That was not something that I had done. In the course of your investigation, um, between Ms. Harris and Mr. Cohn, uh, Mr. Cohn was the uh, breadwinner. He was the one bringing home the money, right? Yes. Okay. Ms. Harris didn't have a job. Correct. Okay. Uh, so when it came to, let's say, a high V receipt, um, that money presumably would have had to come from Zach. Fair enough? There were also text messages, though, between her mother and her that would indicate that the mother was also assisting. So I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I, the assumption would be that in that within the household, he was the one that was bringing home the money, but there was also other other help. Yeah, I want to talk about those text messages with her mother. The uh, uh, Sterling was found deceased on the 30th of August, and what day of the week was that? Wednesday. Wednesday. Were there text messages? between Ms. Harris and her mother uh, arranging for her mother to watch the children, Sterling and Nala, that weekend. Yes. The weekend coming up after Wednesday the 30th. Correct. And were those text messages, uh, did they indicate clothing that Cheyenne's mother had bought for not just Nala but also Sterling? Yes. And so, and those text messages were happening, do you remember what day that was? I, there's, a, there's a ton of them. I don't recall the exact dates. I know it was just in the, in the few days prior to that incident. So. And, and I'm, I'm having trouble remembering the exact date, but it was, at that, it was that same week. Yeah, it was within a week of, of yes. Okay. okay. And so at that time, in that close in time to the 30th, Ms. Harris was making arrangements for her mother to watch both of her children. Correct. You said that one of the most important things that you want to attempt to identify when you have a death is try to determine the last people that would have seen the individual alive. Fair? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you had a receipt from August 26 from a high V, right? Correct. Part of the investigation. And I'm assuming as part of your experience in, uh, in law enforcement, you're aware that those institutions oftentimes have video cameras. Yes. For security and anti-theft measures. Fair enough? 
Yes. Okay. Um, was any attempt made in this investigation to secure the video from the high V in Charles City? Not by me. Okay. Um, that may well have shown not just the people that, if Sterling was there, that were with Sterling, but other individuals that could have identified whether he was alive at that time. Fair enough? Yes. But in part of your investigation, no effort was made to obtain the video, correct? Correct. And it's important in an investigation like this that when you find that information, so for example, that would have only been a few days later, when you, on, from the 26th to the 30th, to, to act quickly to secure the video. Correct. Because it doesn't, it doesn't exist forever, correct? Correct. Oftentimes, those institutions, businesses, whatever, were overwrite based upon their own policies about how long they keep things, 30, 60, 90 days, that sort of thing. So you want to get a preservation order, correct? Correct. Okay. But to your knowledge, none of, that, none of those steps were taken to see who was at that high B on the 26th of August. Yes, unfortunately, in the process of the search, I wasn't aware of that receipt early on in the investigation. If you had been aware, obviously that would have been a step you would have taken. Probably, yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Redirect. You may step down. Ms. Timmons, do you see any reason to start 10 minutes of uh, Agent Thiel? Or I'll leave it up to you. I like your last answer, no. <laughs> so let's recess for the day. I think we've we've been through enough for one day. So uh, we will resume tomorrow at 9 a.m. The weather's supposed to be better. So we all made it today. And with better weather, it should be uh, easier tomorrow. So we will see you at 9 a.m. Please continue to heed the admonitions. Stay away from local news channels. Stay away from national news channels. Stay off the Internet. Uh, Google, things like that, things might pop up. So uh, we'll see you in the morning. All rise for the jury.